Okay, I think we've all had time for a nice lunch break, which I think is important and an opportunity to do some socialization and talk. And I should say I do look forward to having many members of council and a few some others at my house tonight. Again, um, should be, although I have to say for the caterer, we're having a different caterer this night who I've canceled three times because of a hurricane, a snowstorm, and I'm trying to remember what was the other thing. And, and when he actually said he'd come this time, I couldn't believe it. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. Um, anyhow, so um, we've got some really exciting things we're going to hear about this afternoon, and I'll turn it over to Gwen. Okay, so uh, let's see. We're going to kick off uh, with our uh, invited speaker, um, and uh, Chip Hughes is going to introduce him. But let me just start by saying that you know you all know that um, there's a big public health um, effort around opioids, and the NIH has. Um, really launched quite a number of projects trying to understand the biological basis of addiction and opioid-related science. And NIEHS um, has found a very unique niche um, uh, about uh, how the opioid epidemic has affected workers. And so Chip is going to talk to you about some of the um, really outstanding work that they're planning to do. And they've just gotten some uh, funding from the Office of Disease Prevention and the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research to tackle this. And he will introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Great. Thanks, Gwen. I, I, like all of you, um, I also wanted to celebrate Linda. So I just had a couple of things I wanted to say. Um, because it's kind of part of her legacy. And as you all may know, um, NIEHS has been involved in disaster response for a long time. Actually, in our program, going back to the Exxon Valdez uh, in 87. Um, but since Linda has come, we've sort of stepped up our game to another level. And um, part of the key to that, which is part of Linda's legacy, is DR2, the Disaster Research Response Program. And I wanted to at least um, give a shout out also to Aubrey and other folks who've been part of this um, in terms of the efforts that we've made to learn from disasters as they happen. And yes, um, we are talking about an opioid disaster today also. Um, as was said before, um, and a shout out to Maureen, uh, you know, the work in Deepwater Horizon, which I believe was like Linda's first day on the job uh, when she came. Uh, I mean, the, the first disaster that you faced, yes. or whatever. Um, <laughs> we won't talk about the daily ones, but. Okay, okay. The day to day disasters also. But uh, also Dale Sandler, um, Beverly Wright, other important people. Um, and, and again, as you all know, um, and you saw in terms of the council members' presentations, um, Linda's always there at the grassroots, um, you know, talking to people and being there and, and really making a difference. Um, the, the DR2, I just wanted to um, mention, this was the first tsunami exercise that happened, and I believe um, Linda got trapped in a bus um, because of a train that was going on the train tracks, which we all realized was... That's why I said everybody would die. <laughs> I know, exactly. <laughs> so that was sort of the beginning of this disaster science process that um, we first did in... Um, uh, in, in Long Beach. Um, I also want to mention we did the climate exercise, uh, the disaster in Boston uh, of the oil tanks in Chelsea. And also that was the 50th anniversary of NIEHS. And um, always want to remember this place for the fest, uh, which really was one of the greatest, uh, I think, events that NIEHS has ever happened. Um, and then I just also wanted to say, as Jose mentioned before, um, in terms of Linda's work in Puerto Rico, um, and really uh, being, in there, being there on the front lines um, and being there, uh, you know, before Maria and really um, building um, relationships at the grassroots level. And, um, and, and as was said in the factor, um, you know. And then lastly, I just wanted to, you know, give a shout out to our whole DR2 team. Um, this is from the Tucson exercise that just happened. Um, uh, with neurotoxin and really stepping up the clinical aspects of DR2. Um, but um, anyway, I just want to give you a thank you for your leadership for that. So 
Thank you. Um, and today, I just want to introduce this topic, as Gwen mentioned. Um, about, about three years ago, we started with opioids as an exposure for emergency responders. Uh, we actually started with it as um, a clandestine drug labs issue in terms of the exposure to chemicals of people who are responders. Um, and, and most recently, we've taken it to kind of another level of exposure to folks at work um, as an issue. So um, as Gwen mentioned, we've actually, I, I will first say that the, the main person who funded us from her own personal budget was Linda, actually, this past year uh, that started this project. And, um, and that actually helped get us um, seed money from DERT and ODP and o OBBSR. Um, but what we've tried to do is build a training program for people who are actually in the workplace um, and who actually are users and abusers of, the, um, of opioids. And um, as you'll hear from Steve coming up next, uh, we've tried to build um, an intervention that can actually focus on a specific population that we feel like we know um, is at high risk um, for opioid use um, and exposure. Um, and as you all know, we're sort of into what CDC terms as the third wave uh, with fentanyl of, um, of, of, of synthetic uh, opioids that um, is sort of driving the, the death crisis right now. And um, this was the program that we did a couple of years ago that looked at um, exposure um, at, for emergency responders. Um, and, and the specific populations that um, get exposed in the, in the course of doing response. Um, so kind of what, what our program is, uh, the goal of it is, uh, is of course to um, um, stop use, misuse, and death um, in the workplace um, and, and sort of develop the key elements of what um, a prevention approach might mean. Um, so, why this became an issue for us in the past year, um, NIOSH for the first time tied occupations um, and specific unintentional uh, uh, drug involved deaths. Um, and we began to see that many of the um, industries that we work with are industries that are at highest risk of um, death and, and addiction and exposure. Um, and so what we've learned is that it, occupational injuries in the workplace, we believe, are part of the drivers for why use and abuse and death and addiction are happening. So we feel like we have um, kind of an angle where we can intervene to potentially prevent um, these deaths from happening. Uh, this past year, we held a workshop um, that looked at stress in the workplace and addiction um, in Pittsburgh. And actually, Steve was one of our speakers um, at that meeting, um, and that sort of um, kicked us on this path of um, attempting to think about um, a kind of prevention paradigm for um, intervening in this process. Um, and, and as you all know from the translational research paradigm and others, um, we've tried to develop it around the primary, secondary, tertiary levels of prevention uh, that kind of drive our work. So without further ado, I wanted to turn it over to my colleague, Steve Romero. Um, he's been um, a, a safety and health expert with the United Auto Workers Union. Um, they have been actually grantees of NIEHS for the last 20 years. Um, and and um, to me, Steve has become an incredible advocate for this issue. Um, and and um, I think he brings um, street smarts and streetwise uh, knowledge that we wanted to share with you all today. So thank you very much, Steve. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my, my throat's a little hoarse. I got some throat problems, so I'll, I'll do my best. Um, as Chip so kindly introduced, my name is Steve Romero. I'm a UAW health and safety representative uh, out of, based out of Sterling Heights, Michigan. I'm a proud member of Local 2280. Before I get started, uh, I would like to bring uh, greetings from my boss, UAW Vice President Roy Gamble, Region 1 Director Frank Stuglin, your Regional 8 Director Mitchell Smith, and the Director of Health and Safety, Brett Fox. What crazy times we are living in, never in a million years would I have thought my life's journey would lead me to, into a room with you fine people. 
So thank you very much for having me. I want to tell you how I became involved in the fight against the opioid epidemic. Before I was lucky enough to meet Chip and his team, my family suffered the tragic loss of my brother. That's him. Jeff was an all-American guy, good looking, kind, playing sports, and was college educated. He was to calm in everyone's storm and would give you his last dollar, even if you wanted it. A testimony to how incredible my brother was is over the 500 people that attended his funeral, and most of them he hadn't seen in 30 years. He really was one of the good guys. I am positive you would have fallen in love with him too. My brother became dependent on opioids after years of damage his body suffered by playing sports and working on the shop floor. After countless sports injuries, one that required a nasty shoulder surgery, Jeff was hired by Ford Motor Company in 1999. If we fast forward five years, at any physical demands of manufacturing plants and a doctor's visit was inevitable. My brother went to the doctors only to be told that pain management was his only op treatment option. This went on month after month, year after year. That was until one day he walked into the doctor's office and was told, sorry, we can't give you any more pain meds. They're too difficult to give out. As he leaves the doctor's office wondering how he'll deal with the pain, it wasn't long before he went to the streets for his medicine. At first he bought 90 oxys, just as he was prescribed. Then he bought 120, then 200, and so on and so on. At the peak of his dependency, Jeff was taking 20 to 30 oxys a day, over 10 times the prescribed daily dose. How is that sustainable? It wasn't. After half a dozen years or so, and after being placed on OxyContin as the only treatment for his pain, I found my brother, <clears throat> the one that made me cool dead in his bed at the young age of 48. As you can imagine, my family was devastated, destro destroyed, some would say. His parents lost their son, his siblings lost a brother, his daughter lost a father, and the UAW and Ford lost a dependable worker. All because we failed to understand the dangerous game of opioid pain management. So after reeling from Greece, our grief, my sister Tracy, who was the director of organizing for the United Auto Workers, met Jonathan Rosen at a special bargaining convention in Las Vegas. She was taken back by what she had learned during Jonathan's presentation. And it wasn't long after they had met that Jonathan had suggested that we share our story to the delegation of UAW workers at the Health and Safety Conference in Black Lake. I don't know why I agreed to do this. I have never spoken about my brother's dependency on opioids before let alone publicly announce it to the brothers and sisters of our union. But that's what we did. I cannot begin to tell you how important that decision was for me. It allowed us to talk to 250 people about the dangers of opioids and the many triggers for their use. The information I received from the workshop that Chip and his team put together was a game changer for me. My vision started to clear and the fog of grief started to lift. Add that to being able to speak to, directly to my union brothers and sisters and I know we had to do something. It was time for me to understand why so many people in our plants are facing this crisis. So after digging into it, I found out that a large portion of opioid dependent workers have a direct correlation between workplace injury and opioid dependency. Whether it be from a single event injury or accumulated wear and tear, we have brothers and sisters in our plants who are becoming dependent on opioids because they got hurt at work. I know there isn't anything I can do to bring back my brother or the hundreds of thousands of other precious souls that have suffered or have lost their battle to opioid dependency, but I can try to do something to help prevent others from suffering the same fate. Even if it involves standing up in front of a group of strangers, sharing a very personal story, and trust me, me and this is the third time I've done this, I'm as nervous as a cat on a porch full of rocking chairs. I could sit here all day telling you how incredible my brother was, how he was a giant of a man, even though he stood 5'6 and weighed 132 pounds. I could tell you how he became and remained a father to a child that wasn't biologically his. I could tell you how incredibly inclusive he was of other races, religions, political parties, or who someone decided to marry. I could tell you how this planet is worse off without him. But this issue just didn't happen to my brother. This epidemic has killed hundreds of thousands of someone's brothers and sisters. No one is immune. This epidemic is in the classroom, the operator, operating room, the boardroom, and it might be a good bet. It could be in this room too. The time for shame and ostracization is over. 
If we as a nation are going to survive, then removing the stigma that is unjustly attached to, to those suffering an opioid use disorder must be eliminated. We must use education, compassion as our leading thoughts. History has proven time and time again in this country that if we educate the masses, then ignorance will not prevail. For me alone, standing up and demanding the end of this epidemic is one thing. The real power is in numbers. It's time to treat those affected by this epidemic the same way we would treat other epidemics this world has faced, with compassion, education, treatment accessibility, and financial resource. I'm not an expert. I certainly don't have all the answers, but I have met some incredible people that do. Take New York State Abusman Project Director Stephanie Campbell, for instance. Stephanie's dedication, knowledge, compassion, and drive for the need for opioid use recovery treatment accessibility is beyond inspiring. She defines the meaning of a recovery warrior. The work she does for the state of New York has undoubtedly saved lives. Your very own Chip Hughes, the deep passion and knowledge that he has for how important training, education, and overall wellness is to the, vi is to the viability of humanity is award-winning to say the least. The work he and his team do saves lives. Raj Mehta, the rock and roll recovery warrior, as I like to call him. His style is raw, unadulterated, deliverer of hope. Which seems to resonate with the youth of Southeast Michigan. He too is saving lives. Jonathan Rosen, if you never met Jonathan, you're missing out. Jonathan may very well be the kindest person on the planet. Combine that with the absolute understanding of the need to remove the stigma of those that suffered an opioid use disorder and you have yourself one heck of an ally in combating this disease. Yeah, he saves lives too. Today, all of you, by just the fact that we are sitting here today talking about the removal of stigma and the importance of educating the workforce will save lives. You see, this epidemic, epidemic can be eradicated. It isn't invisible like other epidemics this world has faced. We know the causes, the incubation, and the progress of this disease. The genetic makeup of this evil is lurking in plain sight illness, pain, despair, stigma. Mix that with an underlying amoeba of unscrupulous pharmaceutical companies and criminal medical doctors, and you'll come to understand the genetic makeup of this man-made superbug. Recently, there have been some positive things happening, and it looks like the dealers of despair are slowly being, sure, slowly being held to account. The fear, the loss, the destruction of community, the cost of the workplace, the complete dismantling of families, and the sentence of agony that these monsters have placed upon this country must be answered for. So, so, so to those of you who are putting these monsters in check, thank you. The Romero family is truly in your debt. We are also gaining some ground on, the war, on this war on the education front with programs like the NIH's WPT and the many other actions of those whose life work is eradication of stigma, hope is still in play. Chip had mentioned earlier that this past May, I was lucky enough to be a part of the NIAHS WPT United Steelworkers Conference. What took place in Pittsburgh was brilliant. People from labor, academia, medical, and advocacy shared their thoughts on what each other were doing to combat this disease, as well as the other stressors that dwell within our workplace. What became clear, crystal clear, was individually, we're all pretty awesome. But the thought of working in concert created a whole new definition of the, of the meaning of the word brilliant. Somebody really should call Webster. Think about that for a second. The incredibly smart folks in the academic world have spent the lifetime scoring over thousands, if not millions, of statistics, processes, and behaviors. The answers they have can only be obtained through a lifetime of research. The compassionate drive of doctors, nurses, and dependent advocates is on par with those of a higher power. The experience they have on the front lines of this national epidemic is paramount to stopping this disease. Combine that with their understanding for long-term treatment, and you have yourself some real saints. Labor unions, we have always been boots on the ground advocacy muscle. Their determination for the betterment of the entire human race is beyond reproach. Mix all those disciplines together, and what you have is an intelligent, compassionate, boots on the ground army of recovery warriors. The, con the conference in Pittsburgh was amazing and still bearing fruit today. So what can we do? As I said, I don't have the answers, but in a comparatively short time, it didn't take me long to find out that there's a whole host of highly intelligent, dedicated, and compassionate individuals, and it's time to put them all in play. One way that happens is through the WPT. Please allow me to tell you why I know this program works and why getting it out to the workplace is a game changer. If I'm gonna demand the removal of stigma, from those who suffer a opioid use disorder, then I first remove, must remove it from myself. 
You see, uh, <clears throat> up to and after, excuse me, up to, we there? Right, up to and after the death of my brother, I didn't think much of those who were in the thralls of addiction. I was one of those people that blamed the addict. I thought that you reap what you sow. You knew what you were getting into. Yeah, I knew it was difficult to, it was to quit taking drugs, and yes, I knew the stigma prevented those from seeking treatment, yet I still thought it was a choice. I thought my brother chose opioids over his family. And unfortunately, my ignorance has caused me great regret and a sense of shame that I thought would never go away. That was until I sat through the beginning development of the NIEHS WPT's Opioid Dependency Awareness Training presentation. I was taken back by the way in which they totally changed the narrative for me. How instead of disappointment, anger, blame as the lead character in my life's movie, it placed compassion, understanding, and the removal of stigma in the starring role. This training is simple, fluid, and thought-provoking. I was educated on the science, the dangers, and the necessity of removing the stigma. It taught me that though my thoughts of those who are suffering may not have been unjust, but that I was just making my judgment as one of the uneducated. To me, it was, to me, it was the get out of jail free card that I needed. I was able to forgive myself, which allowed me, thinking, allowed me to think how freeing it would be if we could teach those who are struggling to not blame themselves, to not feel as if they're less than or worthless, but to give them absolute understanding, encouragement, and pathways to treatment. If this program can take a guy like myself, and turn his pain into power and then into purpose. I have zero doubt it will help those I represent in the UAW. Over the last year, it has become obvious that there's a direct correlation between workplace injury and opioid dependency, so taking the fight directly to the source seems like the right move to make. The UAW has a long-standing history of bargaining for better working conditions, access to medical care, higher wages, and fair treatment for the workers they represent. We have over 430,000 active role brothers and sisters who come from very diverse working environments, from very small shops to the, to the massive plants of the big three. And because of those different environments, availability of resources greatly, differs greatly. For instance, in the big three, the UAW is able to negotiate full-time health and safety reps such as myself, ERC reps, ergonomic reps, insurance benefit and job standard representatives. This allows for greater input into policy and practices. For some of the smaller shops, the UAW has representatives that cover multi multiple regions. So to help facilitate things, the UAW has appointed local discussion leaders. It is because of these hardworking leaders that we can reach all our members. And they have proven to be a great asset in our working environment. Compassion, understanding, the removal of stigma. It's basic human decency. This is the reason the UAW looks forward to piloting the NIEHS WPT in some of their facilities, with hopes to find ways to cascade it to 430,000 of our members. Please allow me to walk you through one of our, pl our plan at those facilities. <laughs> I did that. You know, that that's, that's pretty impressive that I was able to do that, just so you guys know. <laughs> anyway, we'll host Jonathan to walk us through some training. The audience will consist of UAW leadership and plant operations committee management. We also provide training through Jonathan, who will be responsible to train management supervision and UAW district uh, persons, train the trainer type stuff. We'll, during that same quarter, we'll establish a peer, peer network. In the second quarter, we'll begin to train the four level, floor level supervisors to be able to com confidently discuss the important, importance of opioid prevention and awareness. This will prove to be the longest part of the training as supervision is spread out over three shifts and due, and due to unforeseen chaos of a manufacturing facility, getting supervision off the floor is at times challenging, which is another reason having multiple trainers is vital. Third quarter, this is the whole reason we're doing it, the workers. This is the tricky part. Just, to, just in one facility, there's over 1,000 1, workers and in some plants in the big three, we're talking over 5,000. We'll have to use established ways to get them the information. In, in the manufacturing environment, most facilities have daily, weekly, or monthly toolbox talks or team meetings. During these meetings, a slot of time will be carved out to coach their employees on the dangers of opioids and the importance of understanding opioid use disorders. Due to the environment of any manufacturing plant, each facility will have to customize the program to fit within their process. Fourth quarter. I get what? There it is. Due to the validity of the environments, the importance of this message 
We have decided that establishing a task force is needed to support a continued focus on, on the dangers of developing an opioid use disorder program and the utmost importance of removing the stigma. So as I said earlier, it's, it's, it's really simple, really easy to do. It's going to prove difficult in, in big plants like that and, and, and in the manufacturing environment due to the costs, you know, when you have any downtime, but uh, we're committed to making it happen. What I'm going to talk about next, you may have recently heard that the UAW has introduced a national contract resolution that specifically targets the need for a non-disciplinary, more robust educational, compassionate treatment oriented approach to those who may be suffering a substance use disorder. It also looks to strengthen ergonomic, ergonomic language and add alternative work-related injury treatment. For those of you who may not have heard of this resolution, I assure you this is monu a monumental demand that the UAW has set forth. It is really great stuff. I could certainly get it to you electronically if you wish. This incredible contract resolution is not the only thing being done by the UAW against this horrible disease. For about a year and a half, UAW Ford has been involved in the campaign of hope. Not only does this program help teach its leaders the pitfalls of opioid dependency, it also teaches them on administering Narcan and other life-saving techniques. Think about that for a second. We have to teach people to use Narcan. We'd have never thought of that. It also teaches them, excuse me, but the UAW knows there's much more work to be done. The contract resolution and the campaign of hope, the WBT, are just a few ways the UAW is taking on this fight. There are many UAW locals who have established programs that help their local union brothers and sisters who may be struggling with dependency. It's safe to say this epidemic has spread in every plant, in every state, so it's all hands on deck. Locally, my chairman and HR manager are in support of not only bringing the WBT opioid training into our facility, but to initiate the peer group program that we were talking about earlier. This peer program will be, set, will be staffed by vetted recovering opioid dependent brothers and sisters who are willing to help those who are struggling themselves navigate the current system and offer support to those in need. We understand that those suffering may not feel comfortable coming forward to a member of management or even us in the union due to the stigma that is unjustly attached to those suffering opioid dependency. Other industries have done the, the same, something very similar with great, great success. Something that's gonna happen in my hometown. I also have a commitment from Region 1 Director Frank Stuglin to offer services and support to the families of Region 1. Unfortunately, Southeast Michigan has been hit pretty far, hard with this epidemic, forcing many recovery organizations to emerge. With that being said, we have access to a multitude of programs who are willing to work with us in providing family support. Frank feels, and I absolutely agree, that if we can offer support and education to the families of our members, then the members who may be suffering opioid dependency will be better supported in their recovery, as well as a place for the family to come to find reassurance that they're not in this fight alone. The UAW knows the cost of doing nothing. We have members who have lost their jobs, their homes, their families, and lives because of this epidemic. We have all seen the destruction opioid dependency can have on the work, worker, and families. And truthfully, our nation's competitive engine, the American worker, will struggle to survive if this cycle is allowed to continue. Collectively, the working men and women of this country can change the narrative. We can remove the stigma. We can negotiate contracts that offer protection to those struggling with this dependency. We are aware this fight won't be easy and victory will not be secure, secured tomorrow. We are fighting against a horrible disease and the almighty dollar. But we have changed the future before. The unions of this country have fought and won before, something we know how to do. But make no mistake, we cannot do this alone. We need, the, we need those in academia, medical, science, advocacy, and law to work with us in combating this disease. As I said a little bit earlier, it's all hands on deck. I recently heard someone say this epidemic will run its course, like it somehow will just go away. Well, I must vehemently disagree. This isn't a disease that will die off because of quarantine or a vaccination that is readily available. This disease is being fueled by pain, despair, lack of education, injury, stress, and a giant bankroll. It's going to take changing the narrative to put an end to this epidemic. Its ugliness has left the mark on society as a whole. Families have been changed forever. Forever. Forever changed. There's no healing. There's no getting better with time. Once you have been affected by this man-made disease, the best you can hope for is that life grows around, your, grows around your grief and you can turn your pain into power and then into purpose. But make no mistake, 
The scars may not be visible, but they run extremely deep. Many things are at play and situations are at times fluid, but there is one constant. Opioids are scary, scary dangerous. Take them for too long and you become dependent. Take them for longer and you die. Workplace injury and workplace stresses may very well be one of the vital organs that make this monster tick. But with real action, real, real sustainable solutions, the number of those who become or have become dependent will drop dramatically. Like I said earlier, I'm no expert, but I am a guy who has seen firsthand the absolute devastating effects opioid dependency has had on the families, the worker, and the workplace. I thank you very much for your time today. It really means a lot. And if you take anything from what I said, remember, we must remove the unjust stigma that is placed upon those who suffer opioid dependency. Thank you. And I got to say it, solidarity forever. I'm open to any questions or what do yeah, you guys want to do? Yeah, Steve, before we have a full discussion, um, I really want to thank you um, for sharing your personal story, which is so painful. Thank you. Um, for opening all our eyes and for being willing to have a discussion with council. Sure. Thanks very much. Reach one, teach one, right? <laughs> well, I think you may have uh, taught many t today. I hope so. Thank so you. So we're open for some discussion. A very emotional and heartfelt uh, presentation that you gave, and, and thank you for your work. My question, or the comment that I would like to make, deals with uh, the prevention efforts and um, specifically talking about antidote. You know, we know that the auto injector is four thousand plus dollars, as opposed to a single dose of naloxone or naloxone rather, that should be what twenty, thirty dollars. So, so. When you do the outreach and the education, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the, the cost associated with you know, saving lives, uh, uh, auto workers, and in the workplace, and the dichotomy in price in terms of you know, treating a, a patient that has OD with, with an opioid? And, and what are your thoughts in there? And what, what, what is it that we're not doing that we should do? Well, <laughs> I wish I was more educated on that. The, the cost, I mean, we know the ultimate cost, right? And, and that's kind of where, you know, the UAW is coming from. The dollar is the dollar. But, but with, with higher or, or better or stronger ergonomics, right, and, and better jobs and, and, and making it easier, we will lessen the chances that we're going to need them. And ultimately, is prevention is... To, is that's the key. If, if you don't have to get to the doctors in the first place, those numbers are going to drop. Absolutely. Right? Um, as far as the cost of medicines, chip may be better. You know, might, maybe, <laughs> maybe you might be able to answer that better than me. Um, but I do know, I want to say that, that I think it was a, you know, the cost of just the workers and opioid dependency, last, I think it was like $11 billion. It was something astronomical. Um, and then you have those that, that you know, the manufacturing itself and what it does to, to the plants themselves. So you have, if you have some, for, for instance, if you have somebody coming in that, that and when you, you noticed, I heard that my brother was a dependable worker. He never missed a day of work. How is that even possible? But with stigma in a lot of employers, um, if you come in or you take a, a, a urinal, urine test and this and that, oh, and they find it, you're fired. So they just lost their dependable worker that for seven years was in the exact same capacity was the day you fired him. So was it a moral thing? Is, what's really the problem? Yet, if I get hurt at work, I go to the doctor, the doctor gives me opioids, and as long as the doctor says I can work, the companies will let me work. So it, does, it doesn't compute for us that because somebody has a dependency problem, an issue, to where they're getting it from wherever they're getting it from. The opioid's the opioid, right? I mean, it, you're either higher or you're not when it comes down to that. And if, if, if it's okay for them to, to work because, oh, well, my doctor said, you know, the doctor said so, it seems almost discriminatory to me. So 
this is a huge issue, especially in manufacturing, because you know, every minute is a lot of money, especially in the auto industry, a lot of money. So the, the cost, I, I, th I think the cost is, is, I don't even know if you can take it into account, because at the end of the day, if this continues and the work is still hard and we're still hurting people, and as the workforce gets older, more and more opioids are gonna be given, more and more people are gonna be dependent. So best I can answer, I, I wish I had more for you on that, but Chip might though. I would hit him up. No, though. I mean the scary <laughs> thing about it is about 10% of all the people. Chip, Chip, you need a mic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, of all the people who are suffering from opioid use disorder, about 10 to 15% ever get any treatment. So, I mean, our feeling is if we could even move that up to like 20%, sure. one out of five to get treatment. Be great. Uh, yeah, it's a long way to go. Yeah. You, know, it, it, you notice I talk about uh, removal of stigma a lot, and that's the key. I mean, especially at least in, in our workforce. I mean, we're all tough, blue collar guys. You know, nobody wants to admit we got a problem because we're worried about what you know, somebody might think. I mean, we kind of, you know, this country did it before, right? I mean, with a lot of situations, I mean, TB and HIV, I mean, once we remove that stigma, you know, you smart guys came up with, with, with cures, you know, and, 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 and acceptability, and it's okay, I can, you know, guess what, I can sit next to you at dinner, we can share a plate. That didn't happen before the stigma was removed. And if we do the same thing for opioid use, you know, disorders, I have no doubt that you will see, you know, the survival rate just skyrocket. I mean, it just makes common sense to me. So I have a quick question. So part of this is um, um, prevention of injury. So, so that will pop, to me is probably a, as important as the second half of getting treatment pro programs. So for that reason, are there changes right now in the country in terms of like OSHA standards, uh, workers' uh, compensations, uh, records, and all those that can be upfront being prog progressive and also like breakdown of like um, uh, you mentioned ergonomic, but there are additional things, of repeated actions, and lightening, and 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 the, basically the work environment. You know, in, in the in the big three, and, and that's where I, I'm on a uh, Ford Motor Company, and I can tell you from my experience, the uh, UAW Ford Health and Safety Department, ergonomics, all that, is fascinating. It is a constant, you know, look to see how we can make it better. Um, <laughs> You would think when they, a lot of people are not involved in, in uh, you know, with unions and, and car companies, you think it's a, you think it's a battle all day long. And, and in UAW Ford Health and Safety, it is exactly not a battle. I mean, sure, we're gonna we're in contract talks, and we're it's all you know, all that stuff is their problem, right? But at the end of the day, there are a lot of people that are focusing on ergonomics, you know, uh, rest, uh, design. I mean, it used to be where you just got the job and up, oh, get the biggest guy, put him on there. Now we actually go to the uh, manufacturers, go to the design stage. This is the workers on the floor, you know, go to the design stage and come up with ways that they think that, hey, I can do this a little easier. Because one thing we learned is you put somebody on a job, they will find the best way to do it, right? Um, sometimes it's not the safest, so we have, to, we have to address that, right? But a lot of times, you know, especially we're finding as our uh, workforce gets a little older, we're getting a little smarter, and so we're sorting it out. So though we have a long way to go, and I think just the jobs that we do, I mean, though we'll strive always to make it you know, easier on the body, I don't know if we'll ever be able to remove it all without giving up our jobs. I mean, it is inherently rough on the body, and we stand eight, 12 hours a day on concrete. You know, we're climbing underneath cars, and, and you know, we're just, I mean, an ergonomist has a field day, you know, on those jobs. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're comfortable. Now the, the other jobs in, in the, the tier two, you know, tier one and tier two plants um, that don't have the resources that, you know, UAW Ford has and, and General Motors and, and uh, Chrysler, I believe that they struggle a lot more. 
You know, so it, it, it may be, be a battle because it could be the difference, you know, if you're talking, you know, it's nothing for a Ford Motor Company to buy, you know, a contraption for, you know, $500,000. But if you do it to a small shop, that could shut them down. Well, I actually am very concerned about the third shift workers because they are not regulated. They have the low, they are the, the youngest workers I mean, in terms of seniorities and they don't, and they, they don't enjoy in, in, in a way of the kind of regulations that you're getting on the yeah. first shift and second shift. And also they're working on the opposite side of the circadian rhythm, the clock is yeah. on the wrong side, right? You so, know, I spent, 20, I spent almost 20 years on that. I was that third shift guy, 20 years. Um, and you're right, you're, it's, there's not um, as much support and resources on, 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 as in first and second, right? Um, but as I, once again, in the big three, and the UAW has negotiated a lot, you know, people to be in place, we're not as bad as, as it is in some of the, you know, the tier one and tier two shops. I mean, it's, it's, it's a dangerous place to work if you don't have the, you know, the people in place to, to help make it not dangerous. So your concerns are valid for sure. Absolutely, especially on the off shifts and shift work and different, uh, we have different shift patterns, you know, where we're working, you know, three days, 12 hours, and we're off two days, and then you go to days and work that. So, yeah, there's quite a bit. I'm Maureen. Thank you for making it real, not only for us, but for the world. Um, it's one thing to educate, it's another thing to engage. So how is your program truly engaging um, the workers so that it's their program, not your program, only bringing it in? Well, what we're hoping, right? I mean, this, this, is, this is all, whenever you deal, at least what I'm finding out, I'm fairly new to this journey. My, my brother passed away 18 months ago. So I'm, I'm new to this and learning fast, right? Um, what we're finding out, that, you know, at least what I'm finding out is if you make it, you know, about, okay, this is what I need you to do, this, this, and this, you're not going to get pushback. But what we're finding out with, with this problem, they know somebody. They have been affected by this disease already, whether it be their sister, their mother, brother, their uncle, or their neighbor. They can relate. Now, they may relate, well, you know, too bad. That was on him. They may relate that way. You know, I did it first. But as you talk about it, and, and you know, as you bring you know, common sense, as you bring the science, it's hard to argue when, with facts. What? Some people do lately in this country, but it's hard, it's hard to argue with facts, right? But uh, that's, that's all we can do is give it to them and reinforce, reinforce it. And what, what I think is going to make a difference here is, especially with our workers, you know, I, I can speak from a union standpoint, is they trust in us, right? And, and, and we have built rapport. You know, a lot of, especially in the plants, have been on that plant level, because this will be done at the plant level, right? A lot of the, the, the representatives that have been on that plant has have represented these people for two, three terms, which could be nine, 10, 12 years. They know these people. They know their families, they, they can relate. I feel very confident that we'll be able to touch a large majority of people. We're gonna have those that are just like, too bad, so sad, I mean, but, I don't believe that that's anywhere close to 10% of the people that are going, ah, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe it. Um, just because we've talked about it. You know, people want to know. You know, especially when, especially when you sit there and you realize that, you know, the exposure to fentanyl could happen on a grocery cart at the grocery store. Scary stuff. You know, so that's why I, I just believe it is with, with us being a part of it the way we are. I think that's, that's gonna be the missing link, right? I mean, I, I, I just believe so. Maybe it's our you know, UAW confidence, but it's, it's kind of how we are, right? Steve, Rick? Yeah, just a quick question for you. So as you're going out and giving these lectures and, and making people increasingly aware of the danger of, of opioids, are you seeing on the ground an increasing awareness of the alternative strategies for pain management, both on the part of workers who suffer pain and on the part of physicians who previously found the easy way out to just prescribe opioids rather than prescribing alternative means of pain management? Um, in my very limited capacity, I'm finding that what I see now in some doctors, and that's just from talking to my workers on the floor, is that I think the doctors now are in the scared stage, right? That, that I, don't, I don't want to prescribe them. And listen, I'm making it very clear. 
if people need them, they need them, period. I'm not any way advocating that we need to, you know, abolish these things from the face of the planet. But I think, you know, just like a lot of things we do, it's a knee-jerk reaction. And I think that's what we're seeing now. Um, I think, you know, that the, the doctors and nurses, you know, they didn't just become doctors and, and nurses for the paycheck. They're compassionate human beings, right? They, they want to help people. So I think after the initial scare of, man, am I losing my, my license or it's going to find me or am I going to go to jail, they will start to use these alternative ways. Um, I believe so. I mean, I, um, I believe there's some laws being passed. I, I know in the state of Michigan we have one, I think, taking place the first of the year that where um, when you go to the hospital, you will be offered alternative treatments like, you know, massages, chiropractic care and stuff like that. And you can deny your opioids. And then at any time when you feel that that's not working, you can ask for the prescription. So, th I mean, that's a huge step. Before it was literally, I mean, I think it's uh, pain level three is the vital sign. Well, I don't know anybody that goes to the doctor on a three. It's, it's definitely always more than that. So it's, it, I think it was habit. I think it's, hey, man, this person's hurting. Let me do it. In some cases. Some cases, I think some people made some very, very bad moves. But uh, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful to, to see the change. I mean, with some laws and, and given those doctors that really mean well protection, I, I think we will. I, I think enough people have been exposed to this that they want to make a difference and they, they want it to stop. I mean, I spent, I was on the uh, streets till two o'clock in the morning last night, right here in this beautiful city, by the way. I, I love it. I love this state. I already told Chip, I'm, 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 make a room, you know? Um, but I spent a lot of time with, with, with those that are struggling on the streets last night until about 2 a.m. There's a problem here. People working to work every day see it. Thank you, Steve Lynn. I also want to really thank you for everything that you have shared with us uh, today. I am sitting here feeling that I should have known before walking into this room that this is, of course, a problem that is particularly affecting people who work and, you know, who do physical work that causes injuries. Just as, you know, in my community, you know, we see it in student athletes and, you know, people who also wind up, you know, with medical care that isn't delivered in a way that's that's appropriate in terms of the pain management. And I, I, I hope that perhaps we can somehow think about how um, even this institute or, you know, can have a role in getting the word out to people who practice um, medicine with workers, nurses, uh, the, the companies often are providing um, the, the medical care, the treatment for injuries. I, I just don't think that um, that awareness is there and I think it needs to come um, from, from the workers. The feedback um, from the labor community I think is incredibly important, but of course, many people are not represented by unions and I, I think many of those occupations also, there are a lot of injuries. Um, I, so I, I think that this this is, incredibly, incredibly educational for me personally to hear this. Uh, the other thing that, that has uh, occurred to me here is that um, we, um, when, you know, when we saw the stigma around HIV AIDS um, breaking down, it didn't break down because everybody else in society said, oh, I'm no longer going to discriminate. It was because people who had AIDS stood up and started talking about it and started demanding a better therapy, better treatment. And I, I applaud the union you know, for speaking out on behalf of people who are addicted, who are members of your union. And I think that's so important to put the, the face of your members on this epidemic and for people to not be ashamed of having an addiction. And, I, and so, whether we can help, you know, or the institute can help to provide also, you know, a platform for that. I think those voices need to be heard. I think that NIH, FDA, the medical profession, nursing profession, we all need to hear those voices and that that's critical. And because without that, um, we are going to continue to have the policies. And the, the last point I wanted to make, which again is something I really hadn't thought about enough, but, you know, all of the mandatory workplace drug testing and how um, that is actually contributing to stigma and also um, making 
people's lives a lot worse, people who are perfectly capable of continuing to work, being unable to work because of drug testing. Um, uh, why I never thought of that, I don't know, but thank you, you know, for getting that message across here because I think that that's an extremely important public policy issue that needs to be taken forward. Um, that it's just a, a wrong that's being done. Just because someone is an addict does not mean that they can't do their job. So I thank you very much. Thank you. It's um, my new best friend, everybody. <laughs> Gary, do you want to see your hand? And I think that'll be the last question. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for telling your story. And I hope you find it empowering to turn such a tragic loss into uh, something positive where you can help others. And in turn, I'm sure that you're helping yourself. Um, so I was just wondering with you know, the proliferation of laws across the country legalizing marijuana and folks using it to manage pain, have you seen that being used in lieu of opioids? Well, it's funny you say that. You know, it's, there's a debate, right? And, and like I said, I've, I've been in this very, you know, very early, you know, just recently, right? Maybe the last six months of really speaking with a lot of, uh, you know, recovery warriors, as I like to call them, anybody who's, you know, in this fight. And, and people have difference of opinions. Some think it's the gateway and some people don't. My opinion, if it doesn't kill you and it takes away your pain, then do it. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about wellness, right? It, it's, a, it's about you know, being non-pain free. So I don't know all the other, you know, crazy things that comes with smoking pot, but at the end of the day, I know people that do it, their brother's not gonna walk into a hotel room and find them dead. And to me, it's all I care about, you know? So, I, I, the medical doctors or someone could tell you if it actually works or not, right? But if it works for them and they ain't got to take the opioids, I say take it. Thank you very much, very, very much. I think Pat has something um, that he wanted to say. So um, Chip and I have been kind of involved in a conspiracy here to uh, thank you, give you a little thank you for coming, not just for coming today, but for just, just the work you do. So when I found out about, um, am I close enough? So when I, Chip told me about your brother, I asked him to send me a photograph, a text, and you know, what you did. The reason is I have a friend, Kathy Martin, who lives. Pat, please speak into the mic. I'm sorry, is that better? Yes. Okay. Yes, I asked Chip to send me a picture of Jeff. I have a friend locally who is, uh, who's like you, lost a loved one to a drug addiction. Uh, her son, Kathy Martin is her name. Um, Kathy is also a professional photographer. <clears throat> um, she's part of a program where when people send her pictures of their loved ones who have died from up addictions, she does this. And I hope you particularly like the wrapping paper. And Thank you. <laughs> I owe you one. <laughs> you know, uh, I just want to say one more quick thing. Uh, the moment I met, you know, Chip and his group, I thought the NIHS was pretty fabulous. The last 24 hours, I became to know you guys are great. So, I mean, I know you guys do a lot of research. But it's getting to people like me. So thank you for what you do. You're saving lives, thank you. Okay, well thank you very much. And now we're gonna move on to another concept discussion. So Kim McAllister can come up to the podium and she is going to present a program called Functionally Inferred G by E Discovery and Validation. And we're ready to go when you get up there. Just move the mic really close. <laughs> Hey, 
yeah, okay. Okay, now you can hear me? Yeah, okay. So this is a new concept clearance, um, functionally inferred gene environment interaction discovery and validation. And um, this is um, kind of loosely fits under the strategic plan theme goal uh, one, uh, under so several different goals under theme one. Um, and I did want to acknowledge up front a lot of the people that um, helped with uh, this concept. Um, quite a few different people contributed uh, to different ideas related to it. And so the overall goal of a, a possible initiative that might come out of this concept would be to generate some proof of principle studies for using recent advances in functional genomics tools, technologies, in vitro approaches, and biological knowledge for either new G by E discovery or, and or uh, validation of existing uh, G by E findings. And I think we're all um, fairly familiar with a lot of the common challenges that still exist with um, either identifying new G by E's or validating existing ones. Um, a big one is that a lot of these studies are still very much underpowered. And that's because you generally need about four times the numbers for a G by E study compared to a main, uh, genetic, main genetic effect study. There's also, um, you could try to work around that underpower issue by trying to combine a lot of different human population studies or uh, combine across consortium, but there's still a lot of difficulty in harmonizing environmental risk factors across consortium, especially after the fact. And then we're also very familiar with a lot of the complexities um, still with measuring environmental exposures in, in large human population studies, especially how to deal with the mixtures of different exposures, how to deal with the uh, different timing of exposures. And then these are some other issues that generally come up over and over again as um, also all uh, reducing power uh, for detecting a G by E. In addition to all that, a lot of the genetic variants that are detected in the GWAS are in non-coding regions. So you really need some sort of tissue specificity and regulatory context when you try to follow up those um, analyses to try to get behind what the actual um, function is of that GWAS hit. So in other words, if we had uh, more functionally informed G by E analyses and if we could incorporate a lot of functional genomics an analysis into um, looking for G by E, we might really be able to make some progress in this field. And I wanted to mention that we did a literature review um, fairly recently of looking at the last 10 years or so at the G by E findings. And this was with the help of Stacy Mantooth here um, at NIEHS. And we did find a, a lot of um, articles uh, all relating to something uh, along the lines of gene environment interactions. But the great majority of those articles had um, key xenobiotic metabolism uh, gene variants combined with some of the heavy hitting lifestyle factors, the smoking, the alcohol, the diet, for different cancer outcomes. And these are just some of them that you may be familiar with. These have uh, been replicated or validated over and over again. However, we did find a lot of intriguing G by E hits for many diseases, and some of them did have our uh, types of chemicals and exposures that we study here at NIHS. Um, but they seem to be only represented once in the literature and presumably have not been uh, replicated or validated. And for NIHS, um, you know, there's a number of studies that we have in human populations that do have unique exposures, or they have distinct ethnic or genetic backgrounds, or even rare diseases where the replication cohort really may not exist. So there really are some promising G by E findings that have not been replicated. And just one example of this, um, we have supported Dr. Medier and colleagues, and, and NCI has also supported them for quite some time related to looking at gene environment interactions for childhood leukemia. 
But childhood leukemia is quite rare, especially when you break it down into the individual subtypes like ALL, CLL, and so on that um, can be, may be distinct diseases. So it's been really hard for her to um, replicate these finding, findings in another human population study. So that's just one example. And in general, we know that the functional validation is really lagging way behind. And this is not just a G by E problem. It's sort of a more um, global, broad genomics problem um, as well. And this is just the fact that with over 15 years of GWAS studies and um, all the advances and, and the low cost of next-gen sequencing, the rapidly uh, decreased cost of next-gen sequencing, we just have um, so many GWAS hits that have now been identified that are loosely associated with some disease outcome. But the functional validation and follow-up of those hits um, have been really hard um, to get behind what are the real ca causal variants behind those um, GWAS hits. Um, and, you know, sometimes this is because they are um, affecting regulatory um, information, maybe expression of target genes and target tissues. Those effects could be quite subtle and they could be quite cell-specific. So we really need to have a lot of more functional analysis to get at better mechanistic understanding for both G and G by E findings related to disease in this post-GWAS era. So this brings me to my um, new concept clearance. And so my idea is that a lot of new advances in in vitro and in silico approaches could allow for some of this functional validation and new discovery and a lot more mechanistic understanding of some of these GBIE findings. And um, for the interest of time, I'm just going to really briefly mention some of the most exciting advances in functional genomics tools and technologies. And I'll go into a little bit more detail in a couple um, later slides about a few of them. So one of them is certainly the CRISPR-Cas9 system and some other genome epigenome editing tools. This has been a real game changer for advancing a lot of in vitro approaches. <clears throat> Another is that um, there's a lot more feasibility now than there was even a couple of years ago for doing a lot of different types of single cell analyses. And also, we've done a lot with um, the advancement of embryonic stem cells as well as induced pluripotent stem cells from relevant cell types. This has really allowed us to do a lot more detailed endpoints um, uh, for testing a lot of things in vitro, in vitro systems. There's also the integration of a lot of omics data using various annotation information from some of the large NIH consortium projects like ENCODE and Roadmap Epigenomics and others, and also some advances in computational approaches. Um, and these are all really ways to incorporate a lot of biological knowledge to help make better predictions and associations of GBIE um, re relevant to different disease outcomes. And then finally, I wanted to mention that also there's a lot of excitement about the organoid culture models, the tissue chip platforms, um, other innovative culture system um, platforms. Um, and this is really allowing a lot of in vitro approaches to more accurately model in vivo disease states. Although I do want to mention that a lot of these are still in various stages of development at the current time. So just to go into a little bit more detail about uh, some of these really exciting functional genomics advances, um, one of the most powerful one is, of course, the CRISPR-Cas9 um, technology. This is a genome editing tool that reemerged in 2012, and it is a system that was originally derived from the defense system of certain bacteria against different viruses and plasmids. Um, so just briefly, the CRISPR-Cas9 system consists of directing a Cas9 nuclease enzyme to create a site-directed double-strand DNA break using a small RNA molecule as a guide. 
And then when that repair of that break happens, the system can easily be used to make different targeted mutations in the genome. So there's a lot of possibilities. Um, there's a lot of excitement about different multiplexing possibilities with Casper CRISP-9, a lot of genome-wide screens that you're starting to see. Lots of different um, possible permutations of this. And this was a very recent paper earlier this year that really pointed out a lot of the excitement and potential about the system. However, it has not been used in the environmental health science and tox um, fields as broadly. And I wanted to mention that this was recognized as a very exciting new opportunity for the environmental health science research by the uh, National Academies of Sciences. So NAS had a workshop last year, and it was entitled The Promise of Genome Editing Tools to Advance Environmental Health Research. Um, so I'm ba basing this concept clearance partly on some of the recommendations that directly came from this workshop. This workshop recognized that there needed to be more proof of concept sort of studies with some of our well-characterized uh, chemicals and exposures that really apply some of these next-gen genome editing tools for environmental health research. They also talked about how there needed to be further advancement of um, some in vitro assay development to kind of go beyond some of the more crude um, functional endpoints like uh, cell viability that are still uh, in place for a lot of in vitro studies. And at this NAS workshop, um, they, sh they actually pointed out this figure that um, really just illustrated nicely that even though the CRISPR publications have um, taken off, really exploded in recent years, which is the yellow line, um, the technology has not been as broadly applied for environmental health and tox applications, which is the red, the red line here. Another um, real advancement in functional genomics applications um, that you're starting to hear a lot about is the use of induced pluripotent stem cells. So it was around 12 or 13 years ago that it was discovered that somatic cells could be reprogrammed into pluripotent stem cells. And then these pluripotent stem cells can be differentiated into a variety of different cell types, like neurons, cardiomyocytes, and others. So one can now study genetic variants in um, patient-derived differentiated cells in cell culture. And you can measure a lot of different cellular and molecular phenotypes. Um, and it's really opening up a lot of new in vitro applications that are relevant to modeling different human diseases. Um, there's also a lot of ongoing NIH efforts related to continuing to constantly improve on this system of human iPS cell derivation, growth, and differentiation protocols to try to make these models as robust as possible. And then this paper actually pointed out that there's also a lot of biological knowledge that has been acquired in recent years that might help inform functional lo loci across human tissues. And a lot of this is coming from a lot of large-scale NIH consortium efforts, um, some of which we have participated in here at NIEHS. So there's, there's the epigenome and functional element sorts of maps from roadmap epigenomics and ENCODE. Um, there's the tissue-specific EQTEL maps across a lot of different tissues that's been generated with GTEx, um, and those are just a few. So if you integrate a lot of omics data using various annotation information from a lot of these sources, um, and, and also, if you take advantage of a lot of the computational approaches, especially the advances in machine learning, um, you can in actually incorporate a lot of different biological knowledge that might better inform G by E predictions and associations. So now I wanted to go um, and just kind of very briefly give you a few examples, specific examples of the types of applications that could potentially come into an FOA related to this concept. So this one is a hypothetical kind of um, discovery G by E approach where you might use a lot of different um, 
functional genomics data to try to improve on your statistical power and enhance your ability to discover true GYEs. Um, so you're, what you're trying to do is really prioritize genetic variants that might be more likely to be responsive to a particular exposure or more relevant to a particular disease outcome. So, for example, you might try to use some of this functional genomics data to identify enhancers. You might use it to identify regulatory variants that are influencing chromatin accessibility. Uh, or you might use expression data from organoid models and um, RNA-seq uh, data to try to prioritize variants that are affecting expression of target tissues um, relevant to your disease outcome. So if you combine a lot of that functional genomics data with your um, genome-wide data from your GWAS or your next-gen sequencing, you could come up with a more prioritized genomic variance list, and then you could um, combine that with your environmental chemicals of interest to ultimately do a uh, more functionally informed gene environment-wide interaction kind of study, or GWIS. And hopefully from there, you would uh, be able to identify new uh, G by E's. So this is a hypothetical example, but there have been a few very recent publications and some very recent NIH grants that have started to try to explore this kind of concept. This is another example of a, a nice discovery G by E approach. Um, this was from a recent publication that highlighted the use of a human pluripotent stem cell-based platform for identifying new GYEs. So in this study, they used a high-content screen with the ToxCast library, which represents a lot of pesticides and industrial products, um, to identify a common pesticide that induces pancreatic beta cell death, which is a hallmark feature of diabetes. And then they differentiated human embryonic cell embryonic and stem cells and combined that with some different gene editing techniques to ultimately generate human pancreatic beta-like cells that carry specific diabetes-associated variants. Um, and then ultimately, they were able to uh, identify a new G by E interaction that seemed to be relevant to both beta cell survival and dopaminergic neurons. And this, this may add a lot of mechanistic understanding relevant to both diabetes and Parkinson's. Um, and so this is my last example. This is uh, an example that could be relevant to either validation or discovery, um, G by E. And um, it would be using genome-wide CRISPR screens with environmental exposures. Um, and these are two publications that actually were highlighted at the NAS meeting last year. These screens are really powerful for, for revealing either resistant or sensitive genes for particular chemicals. And, and both of these papers actually looked at, uh, identified both some sensitive and resistant genes. Um, it can be really a, a useful approach to uncover unknown mechanisms for the effects of particular chemicals on gene pathways. So those are some examples um, uh, to just give you an idea of, of what I was thinking for a potential FOA. Um, I wanted to mention that this really builds on a number of a previous um, NIHS efforts related to our G by E portfolio. And we've actually had a really long history of working with a number of the other NIHICs specifically on some of these G by E efforts. So we've had a number of previous trans-NIH G by E initiatives where uh, quite a few different NIH institutes have signed on. Um, and I wanted to specifically mention that we had this satellite workshop at the American Society of Human Genetics meeting um, a while back. And from that, we um, uh, were able to generate six different papers. Uh, most of them were published in the, a special issue of the American Journal of Epidemiology. But they were all focused on a lot of recommendations for the future of GYE studies in human epidemiology. Um, so I'm basing this concept partly also on a lot of the recommendations that came out of some of these papers that really recommended a lot of functional genomics tools and technologies uh, for me moving the GYE field forward. 
I wanted to um, mention also that we especially have a long history of working with NCI on a lot of these GBIE interests. And NCI has been interested in, for quite some time in exploring the idea of using biological knowledge for GBIE discovery and interpretation related to cancer outcomes. Um, so it's possible that they may be able to join us in whatever effort um, ultimately comes out of this concept clearance. I also wanted to mention that NHGRI had a strategic planning workshop last January. Um, they had one session that was specifically focused on G by E, and they noted in that session a number of shared areas of uh, interest with NIEHS that were specifically related to the application of a lot of functional genomics tools um, relevant to G by E. And then finally, um, NHLBI, which is the Heart, Lung, Blood Institute, and also the Dental Craniofacial Research Institute, have also expressed an interest in um, possibly joining us for whatever effort might come out of this concept. I will say that with the caveat that it's becoming a lot more challenging recently for one NIH IC to join another IC's efforts um, just because of budget constraints and other issues. Um, but I do think that this has the potential at least to be a broader trans NIH effort um, like some of, the, of our past G by E efforts have been. And then I did want to mention also just very briefly that this does complement a few other more internal NIHS efforts. Um, so I just wanted to mention, which um, most of you know, that NTP through the Tox 21 and the NCATS program has been working on high throughput screens for toxicants and also advancing a lot of different cellular biochemical in vitro assays um, for quite some time. And then Dan Shaughnessy has been trying um, to incorporate or in improve on um, the use of more genetic diversity and uh, the additional development of organoid cultures and models for in vitro tox applications through um, some of the small business innovation research solicitations and some of the uh, grant, SBI grants that we have supported in the past. So definitely this concept really builds and, and complements on some of these other existing NIHS efforts. Um, okay, so this is the last slide. Um, again, I hope that I've convinced you then that the, the time is right to promote this particular area of science. And again, the overall idea would be to generate some proof of principle studies for the utilization of functional genomics advances with our well-characterized exposures to either discover new or validate existing G by E findings. And just a couple of um, final considerations for a possible initiative. I did want to mention that Amanda Garten here at NIEHS did do an ES portfolio search um, very recently. We were interested in seeing what is really coming in for our NIEHS extramural portfolio in recent years related to the functional analysis of um, G by E. Um, we found a very limited number of ES applications. It was probably too many to really say that much about them, uh, except that what we noticed is that they were extremely scattered in, in, in the studies section assignments. Um, so it, it does seem like at least some of them are struggling to find the right study section home, probably because they don't easily fit into either traditional epi or basic mechanistic study sections. Um, this is, suggests that perhaps more interdisciplinary expertise is needed for review if we have a special emphasis panel that could combine the environmental health science expertise with expertise in gene editing tools, high screen contents, in vitro culture models that might be what's needed to um, really appreciate these grants. These, um, Types of applications may also need to involve collaborations with experts in different fields. So I think there is the potential to try to entice current non-ES grantees to begin to think about applying these technologies for environmental health applications. And for a potential FOA in this area, I think it would be really important that um, they come in with either strong preliminary data that's emphasizing the current evidence for an existing G by E hit, if it's a validation sort of proposal, or at least possible association of gene pathways and exposures with disease outcomes for more discovery-based proposals. And then if they could have multiple independent validations, 
in different species, strains, animals, um, and also if they could have multiple independent cellular and molecular readouts. I think that that would ensure um, that the findings were as robust as possible. So I wanted to thank you for your time and attention. And the council reviewers um, are Dr. Ho and Dr. Tengwe. So um, I, I just have to uh, congratulate you on this wonderful presentation. It's, it's leading edge technology and is really needed. We talk about G by E a lot, but um, until more recently, we don't have a lot of very vigorous tools that we can use to validate. So this particular grant, I think you emphasize multiple times that this is for validation of the functionality of those uh, special regions. So I have a couple of things to add, uh, mm -hmm. even be during our discussions. Uh, first of all, I think it's important that the power, the discovery platform has to have the power because of the high contents database, the more you have the data points, the, the, you need more like power. So anything that is under power, it should not be funded. That, that's, I, shouldn't, I should not use that word. Okay, so I'm just saying that it should not be considered. So the second point is that um, with the CRISPR um, ed gene editing technology, it is a good time to also push for long range sequencing. So, so far, a lot of these uh, platforms are, are low cost, high throughput, high content, small pieces, fragmented sequencing. So in order to have long range sequencing, it's very powerful because you, one can paste together several regions and then get one goal, like to figure out from one individual or one organism or one organoid. But in order to do that, the integrity methodology that is sustaining like integrity of the DNA will be important. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's something to be considered. Uh, Third point I want to bring is about the op opportunities to use human tissues now. Not only like uh, if human studies are not involved, that means we are basically using donor tissues. Current technology is, can also enable pretty much long-term culturing and subculturing without IPS or with IPS. So, so both are possible. So those should be encouraged. Uh, for example, airway, av avioli, um, like culturing for six months, those are all possible. And, and finally, I, I would just, um, man uh, two more points. One is uh, definitely focus on sex differences because oftentimes the, the analysis itself will take out either the Y chromosome or the, so, so we are missing a big chunk in, in that area. And finally, uh, in order to overcome that uh, um, method, method analysis platform, it may be important to push for AI, artificial intelligence, rec pattern recognitions. So in that way, we should be able to overcome some of the hurdles with sex uh, specific differences because okay. it really doesn't need to take out a consider the Y chromosomes. It can be all lumped in, in one go. So those are some of the points I have. Okay, good. Uh, great, uh, thank you for that. I, I agree with most of those comments as well, and I really appreciate the thorough job you did in kind of assessing where the field's at. Uh, we talked briefly um, last week, and it's really broad, for sure. Yes. And when you think about all the entry ways to enter this field, and if you have a really broad RFA, you're gonna get every one of those entry ways, right? Um, so what I mean by that would be uh, the model platform, the toxic int that you're gonna use, the technology to either induce the variation or to search for it, and then, then the complexity of the validation study. So I'm just wondering, um, since you said repeatedly that it's a proof of concept, right? A lot of the technology proof of concept is already there, and you showed some examples, and, and we and others have done some other ones as well, um, where you can you know, take advantage of uh, in, inherent diversity and, and discover that way. But I wonder if it might be more prudent to, to be a little bit more top down on what you want to prove, right? Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that, could you come in with a, a challenge, a disease challenge that you're really worried about, right? And say, this is what we're going to try to solve. Or you're going to come in with a toxicant that you really want to solve. 
And then you ask the grantees to, okay, these are the, the combination. This is the G by E. How would we find the basis for the genetic um, susceptibility? I think that might be a more proof of concept because everybody's mm -hmm. kind of on the same boat, kind of going the same direction rather than you'll have a sprinkling of people trying to do CRISPR-Cas9 and people doing AI to, and, and pattern recognition, gene expression data. Um, and I think it might, we're probably going to learn a lot in that process. And some of that learning is happening in other fields right now. Um, so maybe this isn't the right place to do that type of learning. Okay. Maybe apply the actual um, capabilities we have now. Um, and the other possibility is if you really want to um, leverage the enormous effort it would take to do like a genome-wide um, uh, screen of a, uh, there are some limitations with the CRISPR type screen. They're typically loss of function in most cases. Um, so that's what you would get. But just doing that in a given cell platform to try to target all the genes to ask the question whether there's a G by E interaction is, is more of a consortium approach. And this is where the partners would come in across other institutes mm -hmm. where you know you pick your pick, maybe it's a liver cell, um, cell lines and you, you create a, a panel that could be screened upon. So maybe you cooperate to, to build this knockout library and then and challenge people with good preliminary data to, to take their toxicants against it to try to discover those interactions. So I guess I was struck by the word proof of concept. So maybe um, for this particular field, um, maybe drive it a little bit more on, on okay. exactly what you want them to prove. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's all I have. Yeah, great. I, I appreciate those comments because I think I, that is one of the biggest things I'm struggling with is, um, you know, these are a lot of really exciting functional genomics tools but is it too broad, you know, it, it, in terms of a concept? And, and we did talk a little bit about, um, you know, what's already uh, fully validated versus like a, a lot of the organized cultures that are still in development. And um, I, I didn't really have time to mention mechanism, but I, one possibility could be that if I had R01s and R21s and the R21s were a little bit more exploratory, maybe that would allow more technology development or model development yeah. possibility. Okay, we have time for a few comments and questions. I know Rick wanted to bring up one point. Yeah, so I just wanted to let everyone know when um, Kim talked about complementary programs. So Linda asked me to represent NIEHS on a new trans-NIH international effort that is being spearheaded by Eric Lander and his colleagues at the Broad Institute. And it's called the International Common Disease Alliance. We're going to be meeting at the Bolger Center in a couple of weeks to kind of roll this out. But it's really about an international effort to take GWAS to a different level uh, so that you have large replicated populations. And, you know, when Eric gives a presentation, as he did to the IC directors, many of the slides that Kim used could, you know, were similar to the ones that Eric used in his presentation. So lots of complementary to this program as it's likely to integrate into this broader international effort. And I didn't even have to bring up the environment in Eric's presentation. He brought it up himself. Uh, excellent. <laughs> So for, just to follow up Rick's uh, mentioning, I think it's very important to do um, pop model population. That means um, unique isolated uh, islanders would be very ex exciting. And also the um, immigration, like folks who are in the home country versus the ones that are already immigrated here. So those are really exciting things. And then also looking for um, international collaboration when you have much higher environmental impact versus some of the ones that we're here that we no, we no longer have that high of, of a level. Uh, just to give one single example, it will be, for example, air pollution on the, in the airway of like either asthma or COPD. So that is a good example that we have already overcome a lot of the things that uh, our exposure levels are very low. So basically, you, we have to go outside our country to get good examples. The second uh, good example will be some of the islanders so, you know, who, who have migrated, immigrated to this country. So these are the populations that you can actually see. Maybe some of the, the GWAS will be very high in the, in the islanders. So, so those are good examples. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, one more. 
And then we'll take a vote. Uh, just a quick question. A great presentation. I, I love the idea. For in toxicology, obviously exposure timing matters. Whether you're a fetus, whether you're elderly or midlife adult, and I'm just wondering how in 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 the validation models that are in vitro, perhaps to some degree the in vivo ones, how that can be addressed. Because I suspect gene environment interactions also vary based on the timing mm -hmm. of the exposure. Right, yeah, and um, and that was sort of another question um, that I was um, talking with the council reviewers about of um, whether, you know, maybe the last step needs to have some sort of human component or whether it needs to go back into the animal model. Um, and some of that's going to be kind of constrained, obviously, just by budget and, and those sorts of issues. But, yeah, uh, yeah, that's a consideration. All right, Gary's convincing me one more. Thank you, Gwen. Um, very nice presentation, Cam. Uh, I just wanted to let you and the group know that there is a group of uh, program officers at NCI that are very interested in this topic, and they're probably tuning in right now to yeah. hear your presentation. But they're particularly interested in incorporating uh, biological data to prioritize uh, GBIE associations for functional follow-up. Uh, they've done uh, portfolio analysis of NCI mm -hmm. grants between 2013 and 2017 uh, using the terms uh, biology, environment, and genes, and um, found little or no studies that had functional follow-up. So um, I, I encourage you, I know you mentioned the, the challenge of uh, other ICs signing on, but I encourage you to continue to have these discussions with them there. Definitely. Okay. okay, I think it's time to have a motion to approve this concept. Okay. Uh, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. Uh, on the phone? Yeah, I'm not approved. Thank you. Sean, approve. Okay, very good. I don't think there's anybody else, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, any uh any no's or any abstentions? Okay, we're good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kim. We actually can take a break. Yeah. Shri was, where did Shri go? There he is. Okay. Okay, I think we need to get going. Um, I, I really hate to interrupt because I think some of the informal discussions are as important as the formal. Um, Gwen? Yeah. So we have two more concepts to discuss today. Yeah, um, so Dr. Sri Natador will be talking about um, the resolution of inflammation. For the majority of environmental chemicals over the past few decades, we have achieved a greater success in reducing exposure to many toxic chemicals, and especially for the criteria air pollutants. But still, Environmental epidemiological studies are observing positive associations between exposure to many environmental chemicals and morbidity. Um, we have an extensive toxicological database also showing potential relation association between exposure to those chemicals and any of the morbidity or diseases I'm showing in this diagram. Air pollution, for example, was sure associated with the asthma and COPD, or some of the endocrine disrupting chemicals with obesity, or the polycyclic hydrocarbons, cyclic hydrocarbons, and then some of the heavy metals associated with cancer. You can associate any of the exposure to one or the other of the diseases listed here. So, but the common denominator across all these diseases is the chronic inflammation. So what this uh, initiative we want to address, what happened? <laughs> okay. Is understanding what is causing a perturbation in the resolution that is leading to a chronic inflammatory state as by exposure to the environment and chemicals. Before I get into the details, I just want to give you a brief overview of 
what is inflammation and how it evolves into a chronic inflammatory status. Um, in this diagram, I'm showing a three-phased effort, the three-phased events that happen in case of an acute respiratory res acute inflammatory response. Initial stage is the formation of edema, the seekage of the plasma, which sends signals for the recruitment of the cells, the polymorphonuclear sites or the neutrophils to come to the site of injury or infection to create an oxidant environment to remove the infection or to fix the damaged tissue. Following that is a phase of the monocytes or macrophages recruited to the site to clear the debris generated in this process. This happens with the production of diverse chemical mediators. From chem there can be peptides, proteins, or lipid mediators that facilitate the transport of the cell, neutrophils and macrophages from the circulation to the site of injury or infection. And this usually results in acute risk uh, inflammation results over the period of time. It may be few hours in the case of young people, or it may be few days based on the age, but it is a self-limited process. On the other hand, if any of the disturbance in the resolution of this inflammatory response, either an op below optimal response or hyper-responsiveness at, at the tissue level, or by the generation of mediators, or in the recruitment of cells to the site of injury or infection, or repeated in cells can cause a dysregulated resolution. Such a dysregulated resolution may lead into a chronic inflammatory state. And this chronic inflammatory state is more severe and progressive, and aging has a, one of the major susceptibility factors for the chronic inflammatory state. In the next slide, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what happened in the last 10 years about our understanding of how the inflammatory pro inflammation gets resolved. And it's going to be a little busy slide, but I'll promise to walk you through as much as possible. In the earlier thinking about the re resolution of inflammation is that it is a very passive process a counterbalance between the inflammatory and the anti-inflammatory mediators will over the time fix and the cell tissue gets back to the homeostatic status. But in the last 10 years, understanding on the role of the polyunsaturated fatty acids has evolved additional knowledge onto this. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> okay. Okay. One of the uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid, arachidonic acid, is known to play a role in inflammation. It is known for the last four, de four to five decades. From the, the target of the COX-2 by the aspirin or any an non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs is to inhibit the synthesis of prostaglandins to reduce the inflammation. That is even today the conventional approach to treat some of the inflammatory disease conditions. The real game changer came is when the same arachidonic acid can be metabolized by endogenously available 5 lipoxygenase to provide, generate lipoxins, which are more to the resolution of the inflammation. And the studies from the, a group of laboratories in, led by Charlie Serhans and other collaborators have identified that another omega fat, polyunsaturated fatty acid, omega-3, metabolites such as a special mediator, specialized pro-resolution mediators have major role in the promoting the resolution process. And this is also involved in how the cells, the neutrophils, which are recruited to the site of injury to create an oxygen environment, they cannot stay there longer. They have to be removed. So these lipid mediators change, create an environment for the same neutrophils to send eat me signals like apoptosis me, 
So in that process, from inflammatory to they resolve, move towards the resolution or resolu resolving neutrophils. Another concurrent approach for the resolution of inflammation is the role of macrophages. In classically, we were thinking about macrophages two type, one that participate in the inflammatory status, such as M1 or classically activated macrophages, or alternatively activated macrophages, which participate in generating the anti-inflammatory mediators to reduce the inflammation or move towards the resolution. And new knowledge coming from the field of resolution biology suggests that some of the same lipid mediators play a role in phenotypic transformation of M1 to M2 that facilitate the apoptic eating or chewing of the neutrophils by a process called aphrocytosis, specifically used in this field of research. So the, what's the difference between the current therapeutic approaches for resolution of inflammation is that's what is created from this new knowledge. Initially, the anti-inflammatory was a passive process by inhibiting the mediators. It may or may not resolve the inflammation. Whereas the new knowledge is telling that it is an active process. The major difference in the process of resolution is the removal of the stimulus that is causing the inflammation and also the clearing of the cell debris generated at the site of the injury or inflammation. It's a tightly regulated process, and this kind of resolution promotes the tissue repair and regeneration. So this promises new therapeutic approaches for chronic inflammatory disease conditions. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, the chronic exposure or repeated exposures are associated with chronic inflammation. So bringing in our understanding of how a failed resolution may be contributing to the chronic inflammatory status will aid in understand, understanding the mechanisms involved in the development of chronic inflammation by exposure to environmental chemicals, and that may provide us opportunities for any therapeutic or preventive approaches. Why uh, we want to think of why we want to study the environmental chemicals? I just want to give you a brief historic overview of our understanding of chemical-induced inflammation. Well, more than two decades ago, it has been hypothesized that exposure to chemicals such as benzene, halocarbons, ketones, nitrosamines are known to cause inflammation in the hepatic, in the liver. And that may lead to an inflammatory status such as hepatitis, nephritis, and other factors such as nutritional or alcohol consumption may exacerbate and promote this more towards a chronic inflammatory disease conditions. And we, have, we know that majority of the environmental chemicals can cause either inflammation or oxidative stress, and then oxidative stress and inflammation are two events that interact in, for example, air pollutants cause inflammation and also that inflammation leads to oxidative status condition, uh, or else even heavy metals which cause some of oxidative stress conditions eventually lead to the inflammation as a secondary reaction. <clears throat> and I just want to share you, with you another um, study carried out on the human subjects with the ozone in the mid-90s at the UNC and then the EPA human chamber studies, an acute exposure to ozone in normal subjects based on the um, counting, based on the neutrophil counts in the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid in the human subjects collected by bronchoscopy showed normal, in the normal subjects after acute exposure to ozone the neutrophil com counts come to the no ba basic basal level and they, that indicating that the inflammation has resolved. Whereas in the case of the mild asthmatics, it took longer time to resolve back to the, ba the basal levels of the neutrophil counts, suggesting that an acute exposure to ozone may cause an impaired resolution. If that is the case in the case of a acute exposure, we showed that 
A repetitive exposure may interfere with such a resolution process. For example, we have some of the studies carried out using the high dose exposures such as chlorine and bromine or other halogens. Uh, high dose exposures could cause, lead to a direct chronic inflammatory status. Whereas in the case of, in the real environmental exposure, what do we go through is a low dose exposures. Such a low dose exposure may interfere with the resolution process. If it is more repetitive, it may lead to a mild inflammatory status. So that may be the reason what, the, what we are seeing as the association between exposure to some of the environmental pollutants and the chronic inflammatory disease conditions. As a first step to understand the relationship between the inflammation resolution and the morbidity, we organized a trans-NIH workshop last March at the NIHS with the participation of uh, other ICs such as NCI, heart, lung, aging, and the, this one and a half days workshop was well attended by more than 150 participants in the, at the NIHS and more than 60 people listening to it on the web. The, we took stock of the current state of the science with the leaders in the field providing talks and then followed with the panel discussion sessions. The take home message from this workshop is that we need, still need to continue research in this area to develop comprehensive molecular understanding of information resolution biology, physiology, and pharmacology. Well, this is a promising area for developing therapeutic approaches for chronic inflammatory diseases compared to anti-inflammatory th therapeutics. What we currently have is not absolutely uh, successful in reducing the inflammatory status. And another take, major take-home message for, in the, for us in the case of environmental health science is that there is a need to promote the integration of this field inflammation resolution in environmental health studies. We do not have any study research pro currently funded on looking at the resolution of the inflammation, but we have a lot more on showing, through, at least through acute exposures, how environmental chemicals induce inflammation. <clears throat> so to integrate the inflammation resolution into morbidity, we I'd like to propose two phased approaches. In one approach, we want to issue a notice of special interest with participation from other IC partners who have ex expressed their willingness to be part of this effort. The goals of the NOC will be to support global efforts in inflammation resolution biology. And simultaneously, we want to have a tailored funding opportunity announcement to promote mechanistic research on environmental impacts of inflammation resolution and associated disease morbidity. Okay. Okay. The goals of the trans NIH um, NOC will be to gain comprehensive understanding of the how an unresolved inflammation or dysregulator inflammation, dysregulator resolution of the inflammation result in acute event that drives more chronic inflammatory disease or chronic inflammatory response, and better understanding of the role of genetic and other factors such as aging, diet, and psychosocial factors in failed or dysregulated res resolution of inflammation and better understanding of the physiology and the pathophysiology and pharmacology will aid in developing therapeutic approaches for our targeting key resolution pathways. As a focused approach from the NIHS, we, were, we have to select an exposure of choice. The ideal choice for that is the air pollution because we know we have an extensive and epidemiological and toxicological database showing that air pollutants cause inflammation. And some of the particulate, in the case of the particulate matter, the particulate matters, particularly the ultrafine particles, can settle in the lower respiratory tracts and stay there. 
So it, inducing constant inflammatory response. And see, some of these ultrafine particulates may also seep through the pulmonary endothelium and get into the, cir the circulation and then can be uh, inducing a f inflammatory response and other oxidative stress-based responses in other tissues such as liver, fat, and cardiovascular organs. And the other reason why we wanted to select air pollution is that because it has a multi-organ effect. We can have understanding from the air pollution induced the inflammation and its perturbations of its resolution using other organ systems. So the toxicological database on pulmonary and cardiovascular organs are clearly showing a role for inflammation and oxidative stress. And no one is investigating the resolution of inflammation, as I mentioned earlier. So limited chronic studies in animal models show, but lack of cellular and molecular studies to provide biological possibility, and also for specifically for uh, air pollution, cardiopulmonary morbidity observed in the epidemiological studies. The, so the short-term goals of our uh, proposed uh, funding opportunity announcement is to look at the, how air pollution can per perturb the resolution pathways in cardiovascular system using chronic exposure studies. Uh, using, it can be using ambient or model PM or diesel exhaust or gaseous pollutants. Is on, these studies should include neonatal, adult, old animals of both sexes, and also we want to promote use of cardiopulmonary disease models such as asthma models or ovalbumin induced allergic asthma models. So these studies will aid in getting a mechanistic understanding and molecular pathways involved in the molecular pathways perturbed by the air pollutants and also in the identification of biomarkers. We also would like to have nutritional and pharmacological intervention studies in, in as process, part of this effort because we have a very small one, two grants looking at the uh, dietary supplement of DHA-based or uh, omega-3-based diets, looking at the organic dust-exposed animal models. So that we have an opportunity to also further in, investigate on that area. And this proposal should be multidisciplinary because of the need for expertise from different disciplines. And the long-term goals of these efforts is to have air pollution impacts on diabetes, neuronal effects, reproductive and developmental effects, and also the recent understanding we have between the relationship between the obesity and the asthma and the role of air pollution in that aspect. And these studies also should use chronic exposure models to generate a more mechanistic understanding on the impacts of air pollution on inflammation resolution. I would like to thank the team that worked with me for the last few years in developing this concept, and then it's open for discussion, and then Terry, Kevin, and Jose are the council reviewers, and thank you for your attention. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, I don't know who has decided to go first. Is it Terry? Terry? He's coming off. Yeah, sure, I can, I can go first. Okay, okay. great, thank uh, you. Thanks. So I'm just turning down my speaker so I don't get so much. So um, I was very impressed by this, uh, this program and I felt that it was an important um, uh, advance uh, for the NIEHS to do this, especially if it engages multiple NIH institutes in a coordinated fashion. And of course, as three said, many debilitating diseases are characterized by chronic inflammatory states. And I also like the idea of a phased approach with an initial investment that shows proof of concept and building on knowledge that comes from understanding mechanisms uh, and to encompassing more environmental exposures beyond air pollutants and ultimately interventions based on biomarkers of disease and improve health outcomes later on. Uh, this also complements, actually, I thought, with the concepts uh, that was brought up at the last council meeting by Bob Wright and, and Brad Reset on effects and exposures on trajectories of existing chronic diseases. <clears throat> and I encourage uh, maybe some of that being put also into the announcement. Um, so regarding air pollution, uh, 
Sri and, and Jose and I talked about that as a sort of um, agreeing that it can serve as a test case. Uh, but one of the things we explored a little bit was, um, and we're going to fully leverage NIHS investments and research on other airborne lung toxicants that might be beneficial to expand this to others like secondhand tobacco smoke, e-cigs, or certain kinds of nanomaterials, uh, maybe uh, in later versions of this. And uh, this can, because these can also induce unresolved pulmonary inflammation and chronic cardiopulmonary disease. And regarding extra pulmonary systems, um, which would come later on with the more chronic exposures. I think it might be important to include primary lymphoid organs, such as the thymus and bone marrow, and also secondary lymphoid organs, such as the spleen nodes, the malt and vault, and others. And these uh, obviously are going to be targets of, of these um, air pollutants that can modulate immunity and resolution of inflammation, uh, tissue regeneration and repair uh, in a chronic fashion. So. Uh, I'm, in, I'm very much in support of this, and I think that it's a, a very good beginnings of um, <clears throat> an important program for the NIHS. Okay, thank you, Terry. Jose? Yeah, so, uh, Sri, uh, Terry and I, we had a discussion over the, the concept. You know, I think it's a, it's a very important field. It's a space, certainly, where NIHS, you know, should be present. And, you know, we talked about the scope and, and the focus of uh, inflammation and resolution of inflammation. And we agree that, you know, um, chronic exposures to ambient particulate matter, et cetera, to keep it on the uh, inhalation tox, cardiopulmonary um, uh, system, uh, considering that uh, inflammation and resolution of inflammation certainly covers all organ systems in the body. So, you know, we wanted to, we, we agree uh, in principle that uh, that a focus approach would be a, a good way to start. Um, and I think, you know, that uh, the inflammatory resolution biology workshop provided the foundation and, and uh, sort of uh, open up what the needs in the field are. So I think that was uh, really important to get that information for the development of this concept. Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly I'm very enthusiastic about it, uh, particularly from the standpoint of uh, there's still some multiple unknowns about some key players in inflammatory responses and resolution as it relates to immune cells. Uh, one thing that I didn't get a chance to discuss with you that came to mind as you're presenting this, uh, from a mechanistic and molecular biology standpoint, does resolution always uh, of inflammation itself, does it always involve repair and tissue regeneration? You know, I think that's a question that deserves more attention. Um, and I think the other point that I was going to bring up is uh, one of the uh, short-term goals that we discussed was the nutritional and pharmacological intervention. And the question is, you know, that also came to mind as you're presenting this, which, by the way, you know, was a, a real good presentation. Um, it's, you know, uh, are we too soon to be talking about nutritional and pharmacological intervention? Because it seems to me that there's still room for identifying what are the valid uh, therapeutic targets for not the development of inflammation, but the resolution of inflammation, you know. So uh, from that standpoint, you know, I feel that um, um, I'm, I'm open to the idea of the further discussing, you know, whether uh, it's the right time to also include within the scope of the program uh, nutritional and, and pharmacological intervention. But other than that, you know, I think it's, uh, it's a phenomenal uh, area. Uh, the concept is well developed and uh, I think it's important for us to be focused because it could be this, without yeah. a narrow focus, it could just go either way for proposal submissions and uh, receival of proposals. So we certainly that. take the point into consideration, Jose. Thank you. Okay, any other comments or questions? Linda, do you have one? Um, I do have just one, one comment. Um, Shri, you know very well how difficult it is to do chronic exposure studies to something like PM, any kind of PM. 
Um, NTB has conducted chronic exposure studies of different gaseous pollutants, mm -hmm. including ozone and VOCs and so on. So that kind of data could be existed. It may be that there may be opportunities to mine that data to, um, in, more, in more detail. But to do any kind of like long-term chronic study with any kind of particulate matter is extremely difficult. Jose? microphone. Press the button. Oh, okay. <laughs> very, very interesting proposal. Um, and I see that at, at, towards the end you do include uh, reproductive outcomes. And, uh, but as you went through the uh, presentation, very little. Can you sort of uh, a, talk a little bit about what do you have in mind in terms of reproductive outcomes? Um, whether it's really about pregnancy in humans or you're looking at more in animals and other uh, groups? I mean, uh, what we were thinking about more um, in utero exposures and then neonatal, ex continue with the neonatal exposure models. Yeah. Okay. Brad. So I, <clears throat> I think I get the rationale for your short term and difference between your short term and your long term goals. My concern is that when you look at areas like the central nervous system, you, you may or may not learn as much from the cardiopulmonary studies. You may not learn from the cardiopulmonary studies what you need to be able to conduct or even understand the central nervous system uh, effects. And so I'm, so I'm not completely convinced that, that the stage approach will, will ultimately benefit you in you know advancing this this mission across these other disease states and that you may lose an opportunity in in very important sets of diseases by by delaying and not putting forth some of these efforts in in, in particularly challenging uh, organs that have very different uh, repair mechanisms if any and and just uh, where, where the study will be much more complex I mean, um, one of the reasons what we were thinking about having some of those uh, neurological effects to be studied in the latter phase is because of the difficulty of, and also the existence of some of the models to investigate right now with the exposures. So, and I'm, I will be open to have that effort also as if there are models available to move forward in that direction. Sure, I have a question for Brad. So do you think that the, um, the sort of evidence base for pursuing full-blown R01s for CNS and neuro outcomes is already there, or would that be an area that would require developmental work so that, you know, using different tools or bringing the tools to bear on this as a more emerging part of the field would benefit from a sort of smaller targeted R21 type effort? I think it's right on the edge. I could okay. I could conceive of of ways forward that would that could leverage existing literature to justify the R1 level grant. So I think it's right on the edge. Especially I think AD you could do it now if it were mm. clever grants. PD would be a little trickier. Yeah. ALS is impossible. But I mean I think I mean unfortunately it's because it's so rare it's difficult. But the model systems to follow up on your comment the model systems are dependent. On, there are different ways to approach the model systems, right? So the animal model systems are, you know, for things like Parkinson's, they're not very good, but there's some really some novel tissue model systems or, you know, protein model systems that could be potentially a good step to, to validate human studies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Robert. What I like about this is that first you're tackling a, a process that's involved in so many diseases so that you know, the impact could be huge. Um, and the other thing is that, um, and it's focused on a, on a toxin like I recommended in the, the last one. Um, but I think also the, um, the idea that the, the toxicants, um, the mode of action for this recovery may be similar in many systems. Mm -hmm. And the problem we don't know yet, which yeah. is kind of the point. Um, so if you actually come up with the best systems to unravel what those uh, resolution processes are, and the toxicants that induce the inflammatory response um, 
the ones that affect the resolution could be different. Yeah. Right. So I think that's important to, that's to yep. sort out. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Anybody else on the phone? Okay. If not, it's time to have. A, this is, oh, this is go Terry. ahead, Terry. Yep. Go ahead, Terry. Okay. Just in response to, to Brad's um, comments, Brad, I'm wondering if some of the most models, like the human APOE4 knock-in, might might be uh, one way to go with with the CNS effects. Did you hear him, Brad? Well, I mean, that's that's what I was. I mean, I, I think it's kind of what I was suggesting. Is I think that 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 there, I think that the just the rationale and the model systems may may be better than we think in in in, in chronic neurodegenerative disease mm -hmm. okay. for this particular RFA. All right. Well, we may follow up with you to have a more in depth conversation about the aspect. Look at the literature more carefully to determine how it's ready for part of this project. Okay, so um, we need a motion to approve the concept. One, oh, many more seconds. Okay, um, all in favor to approve, raise your hands on the phone. Kavanaugh, you guys? Sean, approve. Okay. I think you can, yeah, if you guys have been doing that on the computer and it works, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so we, I don't have to ask you if you abstain or any of that since you're going to record it. Okay, so we're good. Thank Liz, you. Liz, I don't know. Is she there? Yeah. Oh, behind me. <laughs> okay. All right, just want to make sure that it's registering. They're voting online. Okay. All righty, thank you very much. And thanks to the reviewers. Okay, so now we're going to go to our last concept. But, um, and, and this is a two-parter. Um, Liam is going to talk about the NIEHS formulation of this program, but before he starts, we're going to introduce by phone, and does uh, Michael Hatcher from ATSDR, who has been the lead program official for the uh, Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Units at ATSR for over a decade, um, and he works with Martha Berger from EPA. I don't know if she's going to be on the phone or not. Um, they, those agencies came to us uh, about a year ago asking if we wanted to join uh, forces with them as they re-announced the PSHU program for the next uh, five years, and they had some specific ideas about how NIEHS could help them fill some gaps that they had had, and so they've been working together on this, and Michael's going to give us a background on the PSHU program so that you'll understand sort of how what Liam has proposed will fit into the larger program. So Michael, are you online? No. Dr. Hatcher, can you hear us? We see you're connected. You need to share your desktop for us. And, and come off of mute. Can you see him? Oh, here come the slides. All right, I think they're coming. We don't have a video camera feed yet or an audio feed, but we do have, you see your desktop, if you put it in presenter mode. I'm going to give him a few more minutes to get organized here. And if not, Liam will go first, and then Michael will go second. <laughs> Dr. Hatcher, can you hear us? We can't hear you. Are you guys getting any communication from him? Dr. Hatcher, if you can hear us, oh, there's your slides. Uh, we need for you to unmute your microphone or begin talking. Both. Or both. Right. 
you have a phone number for him to call? All Nathan's got it. Hey Michael, are you, um, which way did you come in? It looks like your headphone is connected, but maybe you're on mute. You might need to use your speakerphone and call in to the 800 number that's for this uh, meeting. If not, what we can do is we can just share the slides at the at the end so we have a slides too if you can't Correct. go through the webex we we're going to go ahead and put up the slides we'll the ourselves slide. locally here so stand by but he has to be able to speak to us he's got a nathan does he have a number to call into then All right, maybe we'll just go in reverse order. Why don't you just start, Liam, and then we'll, we'll have him fill in the gaps if he, he can get connected. Best late plans, but okay. If you, if you give Liam his slides, we can keep going. Yeah, I mean, or else we'll just be waiting. Yep. We're, we're bringing up the PowerPoint right now. For Liam. For Liam, yep. Yep. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. All right. So uh, I know a little bit of excitement here to, to get things started. Nothing like Jack and my cortisol levels up a little bit with the ner nerves and everything. Um, well, today you've heard from uh, several concepts many of which have been focused on fundamental science, and you've heard about research infrastructure. I want us to change focus a little bit now, and we're gonna focus in on research training. Specifically, we're gonna be looking at how is it that we're going to create or strengthen a pipeline of pediatric environmental health research fellows um, who are researchers, resources, and leaders in this field. And as you've seen with many of the other concepts today, it requires a team to work together, and I'd like to acknowledge Mike Humble and Jennifer Collins who have helped me out through this, and I'd also like to acknowledge um, Michael Hatcher and um, Martha Berger from uh, the ATSDR and the EPA in providing feedback. So today, with this Pediatric Reproductive Environmental Health Fellows Program concept, I'd like to address what this is before I get into the background on it. So what we're proposing here is a training opportunity for pediatricians, family medicine doctors, obstetricians, and nurses. The goal is to strengthen their research capacity as well as to increase their environmental health literacy as it relates to environmental health effects for children and pregnant mothers. We believe that it's important to build this greater expertise in environmental health science research to improve their capacity in communication, research translation, as well as building their capacity to train and educate others. 
And through this, we believe that they will increase their uh, health outcomes of um, increased understanding of health outcomes related to environmental exposures. At the end of the day, we believe that this program is going to lead to an outcome where we've got a stronger pipeline of pediatric reproductive environmental health healthcare professionals who are leaders in this field. We would hopefully have heard a presentation from Michael, but we'll hear about it later. So, but I had this slide in here just to refocus us, to talk about what this PESU network is, the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Network. In effect, what they are focused in on is outreach and education, the training of healthcare professionals, as well as serving to consult and refer with patients and other healthcare professionals. The bottom line here is their mission is not environmental health science research. That's where NIEHS, our part, the partnership with NIEHS comes in. Of course, we've been working with ATSDR and with EPA uh, through the PESU network for a while, through the Children's Environmental Health Centers. We've flagged this on the map here, the different children's centers that have been working pretty closely with the PESUs over time, but it hasn't necessarily been a formal interaction. It's not just the children's centers that have been involved with the PESU network. Our environmental health science core centers have had interactions and, and collaborations with pediatric environmental health specialty units over time. So there exists this, this synergy already. So it's really a unique opportunity to really solidify that uh, relationship. So the rationale, as Gwen mentioned, we've been talking with ATSDR, we've been talking with the EPA. What's the easiest way for us to come together and work to advance um, our, our coordination our collaboration with the pediatric environmental health specialty units. And this really seemed to be a good fit. Um, it will build upon, it will leverage this uh, solid infrastructure of research, as well as the communication and research translation that our unique networks bring to bear. There's been an identified need, a need for consistent, reliable funding for capacity building in environmental health science researchers for healthcare professionals. Uh, Phil Landrigan et al., as well as Mark Miller, Phil Brown, have talked about the need for building environmental health literacy of the healthcare professionals in their service of their patients, in, in interaction with other healthcare professionals, and talking with and engaging with professional networks. The timing is optimal right now. The uh, PACU network has just awarded, made some recent awards. They're on a nice timeline. We've got uh, funded um, PESUs coming online. So the timing works out really well. The importance of the fellowship is pretty clear. It's going to be able to build the capacity of these fellows. Now, what are the fellows bringing to the table? As this diagram would indicate, they're coming to the table with their healthcare knowledge and skills. What we're proposing is that through this fellowship program, we're gonna be working on building their environmental health research capacity, and we're gonna be working on building their research translation and, community, uh, and communication capacities. Combined, this will address to, uh, this, this need and strengthening their environmental health literacy. As, they, as we build this, these uh, well-rounded fellows and increase it, we're going to be building and nurturing a national resource of leaders in pediatric and reproductive environmental health. Now, the, uh, the Ac Academic Pediatric Association start, had a fellowship program back in 2002 and really got this kicked off. There's definitely an interest. They started here in 2002, and basically there's been funding through 2014, and here we've got the number of fellows that were funded in each one of those years. And you can see that it's just kind of had its peaks and its valleys, and there's just sort of been an inconsistency in terms of that funding opportunity. And what we really want to see is to be able to ramp this up. We know that there's a need and there's an interest, clearly. They've funded 55 fellows in this 12-year in this period of time. We want to be able to get it up and sort of maintain a steady state of, of funding. Well, great, they've been doing it. What have been the outcomes of this? Is there really any noted benefit to doing it? Well, yes, uh, Phil Landrigan and company have done a real nice job of, of, 
of doing a review of what's come out of those fellows, those 55 fellows that have come through the system. Many of here are, are pictured on this nice little graphic. Um, but you can see they're doing really kind of what we're hoping, what we would want this program to do. They're going into academia. They're pursuing these careers. They're contributing to the peer-reviewed literature. And from an NIH perspective, selfishly so, they're PIs and NIH grants. So they're, they're moving in that particular direction. So there's this need. There's a benefit uh, outcome. The other thing, putting on my, uh, another hat of mine, is they're contributing to the gray literature, too. These fellows have been developing fact sheets, have been developing videos, they've been developing educational materials for their patients, for other healthcare professionals, they've been developing things for decision makers. So they're, they're contributing in multiple ways. So there's great value to these fellows. So what are we proposing today? Well, now here's the general concept is, um, in effect, we want to have a partnership between academic uh, research institute and a funded pediatric environmental health specialty unit. Do they need to be co-located? Not necessarily. We leave that up to the, to the applicants. But there has to be a partnership with uh, a, an academic institution, a university, and a PESU. The academic institution has to show that they've been doing research in children's environmental health. Um, the academic institution would be uh, responsible for soliciting the fellowship opportunities, developing a training plan for those fellows, um, offering research opportunities, and promoting outreach and engagement through the pediatric environmental health specialty unit that they're partnering with. Is this, um, are there other partners that could be part of this? Sure, but this is the required partnership. Who would the fellows be? Well, I kind of showed my hand at the beginning. We're looking at pediatricians, family medicine, physicians, obstetrician, nurses. Basically, they are trusted sources in health information. And so we really want to be getting to this group here. We're looking at folks who are coming in postgraduate year four in terms of their education at a time in which they've done their residencies, they've gone through the, the various programs, and now they're looking to see where is it that they're going to go to. And we believe that that's an, uh, the perfect opportunity for uh, reaching out to this particular audience. What are the elements of this program? Well, the elements would be didactic coursework. We see that the value in terms of seminar series, perhaps creating a nice educational framework where they're gaining uh, uh, knowledge about toxicology, maybe the fundamentals of environmental health science, you name it, we leave it up to the, to the applicants to, to tell us what kind of didactic coursework they're going to do. Um, environmental health research, it's going to be, again, the, the spectrum. We want the, each of these groups to be playing to their strengths, to draw upon what's there to provide the best opportunities and um, opportunities for these fellows. So it could be lab-based research. It could be uh, population-based. It could be focused in on community-engaged research approaches. But there has to be environmental health science research. There has to be a mentorship element. There has to be some aspect of grant writing to this. As we saw, they go on to get their own grants, but we want to build that capacity as well. Communication activities is absolutely central to this, as, uh, to this program. And that would be done a lot in terms of that partnership with the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit. This can be patient education, outreach, risk communication to the patients, to uh, parents, to other healthcare professionals. It can include healthcare education to, to expand their knowledge of what, they're, of what they're learning to others in this field. And we expect that they would be maintaining some aspect of clinical practice. Now, these need to be integrated. These need to be nicely balanced as part of the program. Um, perhaps even ideally, we would see as part of their patient education, their integration, or their uh, work with the PESU, so they would be hearing about environmental health questions and concerns of their communities that they're serving that they can bring back up into this real world research experience uh, as part of this program and bringing that back 
so that there can be this nice synergy of efforts. So in terms of a training plan, what, is this, what might this look like? These could be two or three year types of programs. And we, again, are going to leave this up to the applicants. If an applicant wants to create in, build in a year that's more focused in on the foundations of environmental health, to present the opportunity for these fellows to gain a master's in public health, so be it. That's great. This is part of what we would see as essential. These fellows are coming in with healthcare knowledge and skills, but that doesn't necessarily mean they've got environmental public health knowledge or they've gone through a master's in public health. So maybe as part of this training, they're getting a master's, uh, they're doing this. Then in years two and three, we've got the opportunity for environmental health research opportunities, the communication, education, research, translation. So again, we want the, we're, we would encourage the applicants to be creative in the way that they designed this program to, pro, to provide their fellows with the best opportunity, building their skills to become these researchers, resources, and leaders in the field. Oh yeah, as I said, well-rounded fellows. I, I got ahead of myself there. All right, so one of the other aspects to this is having a grand team meeting. We know that the interactions among fellows is, is important. But if they're just interacting amongst themselves at that academic institution, eh, you know, you kind of have a feeling like I got a friend over here. But as soon as you start to bring people together and sharing these experiences, sharing their knowledge, um, this is going to be important. But we don't necessarily want to just leave it up to that program. What are those other opportunities? How can we plug them into other research networks? And that would be the thing that we would want to do is to be able to expose them to the range of, uh, of environmental health science research and have this important grantee meeting of the fellows. So what are the outcomes that we see from this program? What would we hope that we get out of this? Well, we want to have, first and foremost, an increased interaction with our NIEHS research community and the pediatric environmental health specialty units. We believe that this is going to be really strong and will help to serve the broader uh, community. At the end of the day, these fellows would come away with a gained understanding and a skill set in research, uh, gained, uh, will have gained and applied uh, research skills and knowledge. They will gain communication skills, translational research skills. Through all of this, they will have increased their environmental health literacy, not only for themselves, but in this process of communicating with others, conducting training, engaging with their patients, engaging more broadly to even potentially decision makers. They're raising the environmental health literacy of others beyond themselves. At the end of the day, we want this to expand the pipeline of healthcare professionals with environmental health knowledge and skills. And eventually down the road, we would hope that as being leaders, as effective communicators, researchers, leaders, that they will increase the pediatric reproductive environmental health and medical education and have it more integrated so that perhaps they put themselves this whole thing out of business because it will be well integrated. So what is the pro, uh, proposed program structure? What is it we're looking at? Length of award would be a five-year award. It's an institutional award. We're looking at potentially three. We'd like to fund three of these institutional awards. The training experiences, as I said, would be two or three years, depending on how the, how the applicant wants to structure their training program. Fellows per award would be two at each one of those three areas. And the estimated cost um, per fellow would be about $150,000. So what might this look like? So first year, we bring in a cohort. There might be six. Second year, now we've got 12. Third year, if it's assuming a three-year type of program, steady state of about 18 fellows coming in. If we go for four, that first one goes off. We bring in another one. And fifth, that one goes off and we bring in another cohort. So the whole idea is that we would have a steady state of about 18 fellows coming through the program. So what mechanism might we, we use? We're proposing, we're not wed to, but looking at it as the K-12 mechanism. It seems to align with the goals of this particular program, NIEHS, as this graph would indicate, we're down here at the end and 
That's not zero, it's one. And um, so we do have experience in doing it, but not a whole lot. But again, you can see that it is a recognized NIH mechanism for this style of a program. The timeline is proposed, but hopefully if we get concept clearance today, we would envision publishing this sometime in the winter with spring of 2020 of awarding the grants to, the, to these programs. So our council discussants will be Robert Wright and Jose Cordero. And as I turn it over to them, I just want to remind you that the goal here is to address the needs of strengthening this pipeline of healthcare professionals who can serve as pediatric, reproductive, environmental health, researchers, resources, and leaders. So we're going to go to Michael Hatcher now. All right. He's connected. He'll be on the phone. We can put his slides up. Michael, can you let us know that you're there? I am here, and I right. apologize for the uh, technical problems. No problem. So we are going to advance your slides for you. So as you go, just let us know when you want us to go to the next one. Thank okay, you. so you do have uh, my slides yes, set up. Yes, they're up. And thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. Okay, let me... Um, I, I'm hearing an echo. Hopefully, everyone else is not hearing it. Okay, we're good. Go I, ahead. Today, what I would I, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with you about the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit Program. Oh, we we mm -hmm. call these PESU. And if you'd go to the next slide, please. Uh, what I want to, to briefly go over is who supports and manages the PESU, what, what they are, where they're located, what kind of clinical expertise they offer, and what they do and accomplish, and why they're valued. So are you able to hear me through this echo? Yeah, everything's fine. We don't hear an echo on our side. You can turn down your speaker a little bit. You might okay, not great. hear it either. All right. So um, if we go to the next slide, uh, the ATSDR and the Office of Children's Health Protection at EPA have been uh, cooperating and funding this program for uh, two decades now. Uh, the program, uh, as Liam just mentioned, uh, we have a new five-year announcement. Uh, we have uh, made recommendations, and the American Academy of Pediatrics have been uh, contacted about this. So they are our uh, national partner in managing the PESU um, enterprise uh, as we go forward uh, for the next five years. If we go to the next slide, the PESU is really a network of specialists. Uh, as, as Lynn uh, mentioned, uh, they are very skilled in research translation, uh, making that uh, relevant to clinical practice and communicating uh, both in terms of uh, the lay audience and professional audience and the risk uh, that potential exposures have for impacting reproductive and child health outcomes. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. Uh, the PESU have a very broad scope in both what they address and who they work with. They work with clinicians, public health professionals, government officials and policy makers, school systems and child care leaders, uh, community members, and directly with parents. So uh, fellows in this program have a broad opportunity to uh, experience both uh, consultation and education on an individual level. Uh, in, in the work that is done through this program. If we go to the next slide, uh, you see again the locations of where our PESU are located. 
these are the 10 federal regions that, uh, that HHS has uh, set up for us. And each of these PESU are located at academic medical centers. Uh, they may have affiliation with schools of public health as well. Uh, and, and specific uh, teaching hospitals too. So there's a broad opportunity both for the academic uh, as well as the, um, the direct uh, community involvement. Uh, one of the things that I do want to point out is that a number of these pay suits uh, have either had or have uh, agreements with NIEHS and doing research. Uh, for example, uh, in the western states at the um, uh, through there, they cooperate with uh, UC Berkeley uh, in doing a lot of uh, outreach uh, through, through that uh, core activity. So, so we do have opportunities to work closely with, with the research centers uh, in conjunction with our PESU. If we go to the next slide. The clinical expertise that, uh, that you can find in the PESU is pediatric, obstetrics, family medicine, medical toxicology, occupational environmental medicine, pediatric neurodevelopment, and nursing. And there's probably a, a couple of other subspecialties that we could identify if we look closely at the 50 or so uh, clinicians that are associated with the program across the nation. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the PESU do a wide variety, as uh, Leon mentioned. They do provide uh, clinical education. Uh, they do trans uh, research to practice. They reach to communities in doing the uh, work of uh, advising them. Some of the things that they might do is work with school systems on school siding uh, that or in better locations where there's not as many uh, environmental pollutant concerns. Um, so there is a wide scope of what they do in their engagement with professional audiences as well as lay audiences and parents. If we go to the next slide. I want to share just a, a little bit of the numbers with you. For the first four years of the cooperative agreement that is ending now, uh, we have targeted our work and reached 75% of our effort has went towards health professionals and about 25% uh, to community members. Now, if we go to the next slide, we can break that down a little bit more as to who we've reached. Uh, you can see that we have uh, reached physicians, physician assistants, pharmacists, uh, nurses, nurse practitioners, uh, trainees in undergraduate and graduate programs, as well as state and local health departments and collaboration with, uh, with federal health, health officials as well. So uh, if we look at our next slide, we'll have some numbers on that. And uh, this is the um, this is the the top ten consultation areas, and I cannot see because of the way my screen is lined up. Uh, I think that's something over four thousand uh, in a four thousand. Now that large other are areas where the PESU have provided consultation, but the numbers for the four year period are under fifty. Uh, so we could go and break that out further, but uh, we, we stopped with these uh, top ten uh, just to give you an idea of the uh, scope of um, questions and uh, concerns that are brought to the PESU. Now, if we go on to the, uh, to the next slide, 
I want to give you a, a sort of a case example. Uh, working with AAP, uh, this past uh, year we have done a um, an ECHO program, which is a opportunity to have two-way communication education that's case-based. And through that uh, ECHO program, um, we we covered uh, lead. Uh, our PESU uh, PIs were the presenters on this, and we had a situation in Utah where the uh, water treatment filters failed during a snowstorm, and because of that, there was a lot of fluoride that hit the uh, the system, leaching out copper and lead. They thought initially that there were only 50 homes impacted, but after they investigated a little bit more, there were 2,841 homes that had been impacted. Uh, many of those had uh, small children, pregnant women, and so forth that were um, consuming that water. The exposure period uh, was short. The exposure levels were high, but they were able to quickly mobilize uh, through the individual that was the lead champion for the Intermountain uh, Healthcare uh, practice there, serving a, a very large part of Utah. Uh, they were linked with the local health department and uh, really turned to the uh, PESU for advice and guidance from what they had learned and applying what they had learned in, uh, in the situation. They uh, marshaled a very large uh, screening campaign and was able to screen and identify uh, that there, there were increased lead levels but not dramatically increased. Uh, they were able to reduce those uh, uh, exposures uh, when they got the, uh, the water system back online correctly. But uh, just an example of the kinds of things that uh, PESU are engaged in that um, that either through their education, their consultation, or uh, outreach, it all links back to real-world issues, real-world problems, and how they can facilitate the resolution of problems. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, one of the things that we really look at is, or what are the outcomes that that we can achieve. And one of the systems level outcomes that uh, has been achieved in this, uh, this current uh, funding period is how the PESU uh, facilitated and brought together a number of groups to really look at bright futures uh, and to influence the increase, either new or uh, more elaborated, uh, clinical screening activities relative to environmental health. Uh, if you look there, you will see the um, the, the areas where that uh, those uh, topics were increased. And if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll see just a brief example of the guidance that was developed here for pesticide exposure that is uh, delivered at the one-month uh, well-child visit. So this, uh, if, if you are not aware of Bright Futures, uh, is the clinical preventive services that uh, is outlined in the Affordable Care Act that should be pr provided to um, all children. So uh, I thought this is a fairly significant systems level outcome that is going to be benefiting children across this country. Uh, next slide. Now, these are some of the less uh, noticeable mm -hmm. Outcomes, but uh, we, the PESU over the years have been modeled. Uh, there are uh, PESU in Spain and Canada. There are, uh, I think, uh, one in Uruguay. Uh, there's about 10 in uh, Argentina, uh, one in Mexico. And at the state based level, um, 
the Mount Sinai group is leading the New York State Centers for Excellence in Children's Environmental Health. So they have uh, brought together uh, institutions throughout the state to increase the capacity and the structure uh, that is is modeled after the current PACU. Now, Liam identified the number of uh, individuals that had been uh, trained. I think 36 were physicians overall, and 25 of those 36 uh, were trained at a PACU location. Uh, so lastly, uh, if we look at how this pipeline could uh, could and hopefully will work, we have an opportunity to stimulate a potential subspecialty in uh, pediatric and or reproductive environmental health uh, as we move forward with uh, having more opportunity to, to develop this kind of uh, subspecialty. Not only the, the community level, but the, the academic research and uh, investigation and translation as well. I think this may be my last slide if you want to move to the next. Uh, so so this is why we value the, the PESU, and I hope it's come out in my presentation. They can provide credible clinical guidance. Uh, they're a bridge between environmental public health and health care. They are recognized for their effective communication of environmental risk, and there's so much more that they do uh, above and beyond uh, what we uh, are supporting them to do. And uh, they're, they're a great group of individuals to work with, and I uh, appreciate that. I appreciate the work that uh, NIEHS has uh, been doing to put this concept forward, and we are definitely in support of this. And uh, I am going to close here, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, Liam is going to go back to the podium, and we're going to ask our two concept reviewers for their comments, and then we'll have a discussion. And if anybody has questions specifically for Michael during that time, I'm sure he'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Bob, you want to go first? Sure. I'm, I'm very excited by this proposal. I've been um, affiliated with pastries for a long time. I worked at the Boston Children's Hospital Pastry for 14 years. Uh, I never got paid for any of that time, though. Just, since Dr. Hatcher's on the line, I just thought I'd mention that. Um, <laughs> Thank you for your volunteer work. <laughs> uh, at, you know, we, I had a, when, when Liam first sent me his slides and the presentation, um, I, I sent back a very long detailed email with um, a lot of suggestions, all of which were shot down as being um, outside of scope. Uh, however, or I, I do think that the end game, as, as you said, is to try to get environmental health into medical education. So I think, I think pediatrics is probably a starting point. I think obviously uh, geriatrics and other, other fields could actually also use uh, help in uh, environmental health. And, and to that end, I, I really think this could be an opportunity, um, and I'll reiterate something I said, because as you were presenting, I, I actually started coming around that I do think it's a good idea to engage um, residency directors or someone mm -hmm. in the pediatric medical education field, because as, as Lynn said, it's not difficult to engage people to apply for NIH grants. That, that has a lot of um, you know, currency in the medical world. So a residency director who is even at 5% effort on an NIH grant is going to actually, it's going to help him or her get promoted, and they'll want to do it, and that will get you an in to residency education. So some of the healthcare communication that, that is part of the fellowship, mm -hmm. I think would be facilitated by that. Okay. The other advantage of that is it's a pipeline. So if the residency director is engaged in the program, if he or she knows of a resident who's interested in environmental health, you know, he or she can direct them to you, so I, to the director. So I think that would actually be really, really important. Uh, I, I like the K-12 um, mechanism. Uh, my understanding is that I could be wrong, but I, I thought they were faculty level appointments, so you had to be faculty in order to get a K-12, because it's like a, it's sort of like a K-08 or a K-01. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure of that, but I actually think that's a good thing, because it's very difficult to 
recruit people into this field if they have to live in abject poverty longer. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I sort of jokingly mentioned that I didn't get paid. I lived in abject poverty for a long time because I was in training for a very, very long time, uh, in part because of things like that. And I think if we're going to engage people, particularly at a stage of their life where they're starting families and they have all these other financial pressures, that bring, being able to hire them and bring them on as faculty would actually be a good thing. And I actually think would also increase our pool even further because there may be junior faculty at an institution that we could then appoint as well in order to get them some protected time. Uh, but other than that, I, I think this is a great start uh, and I, I, I fully endorse it. Thanks, Bob. Jose? Well, thank you both for a great presentation. And uh, um, I was just sitting here, uh, and I have to say that it was a little bit um, uh, sort of what Joe Rivera uh, once said of uh, deja vu all over again. Um, I trained, my, my original training in the 1970s was in genetics. And at the time, there were only like uh, four or five training programs throughout the US. And uh, uh, a, there was a wonderful program that was developed by the uh, NIHTHD and others to actually train clinicians to train, go and do the genetics, clinical genetics, et cetera. That now there are hundreds of, uh, and it's just a specialty in itself. And I think that in environmental health, we're lagging in actually doing uh, the same thing, or the, then there is a great need. Um, and I see this uh, program as a very important step in moving in that direction. And the hope that uh, it can go from being a, um, an activity or, or part of what NIHS does, and actually that it could be joined with other uh, institutes, including child health, for example. Um, a, it, the, I think that the idea of building uh, health literacy and environmental health literacy and developing these health uh, uh, professionals, I think is extremely important. And, and it's going to help close the loop uh, in terms of uh, we start in environmental health with communities to develop the research, but then at the translation, the, the, the group of uh, clinical uh, a, whether pediatricians or healthcare providers that can actually bring that information and translate it and share it with uh, individuals with other healthcare providers is going to be what's going to close the loop. Um, and I have to say, I've seen that happen. Um, a, we in Puerto Rico with our PROTECT program uh, and collaborating with Mount Sinai, uh, we, we actually got a very small grant it didn't pay my salary either, <laughs> uh, and that was fine. Um, but we were able to train four uh, fellows over the course of two years, and um, and actually uh, one of them uh, that actually happened to be a veterinarian. Then we may have to think about that as also an option. Ended up um, and being the state epidemiologist at in the, at Puerto Rico, and. Um, uh, that in, actually it's become an, a very important figure in public health and uh, actually has done a lot in terms of the environmental health and communi uh, uh, communicating environmental health issues, particularly there in the Zika and the whole questions of pesticides and larvicides, et cetera. Uh, so I think that this is a, not only something very important, but um, something that actually is going to be critical in completing the loop of bringing science into translation. Thank you. OK, thanks for your support. Let's hear from a few others. Got two over here, and then two over here. Go ahead, Brett. Um, so I'm, I will say that I'm pro anything that increases the pool of physician scientists. So, so you, you've got my interest there. I, I had some significant concerns when I read the initial con, uh, concept note, and Bob and I discussed this a little bit as well. And, um, I mean, I think that to start with, I'd say that, that for NIEHS to be, to take this on, I think this really needs to be about research. And you had that, you know, you had that circle of, of, of life diagram that you showed. And I mean, you, you talk about the research part, and then you also had the, the translation community, 
communication bits, I would really make that part of research. I mean, I think that those can be scholarly activity that can add to our body of knowledge. And so instead of viewing that as a, uh, as a, as a really a separable entity, I think it's just one option for, for, for the, the, the trainees. Because I think practically when it comes down to this, when you showed the Landrigan slide, uh, the data, they're training physician scientists for the most part. And I think that, that's what our mission should be. And those physician scientists are gonna be in the best position to translate that, 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 that research. The, the practicing clinician, I've said this before, is really going to be, find it very difficult to be a strong advocate for, for uh, environmental literacy in, the, in, in clinical practice. It's just not a realistic goal. And I think that these, by, by making communication and translation part of scholarly activity in an academic life, it's a much more sustainable, um, I think it's, it's a, the, the, the goal is much more sustainable. Um, I would strongly encourage you to make the clinical training limited and focused. That that is incredibly subject to be abused. So you you know if you if you it should be no more than 20% of the training, and it needs to be really well articulated what the restrictions are so that you're not just ending up in a primary care clinic seeing 30 patients in an afternoon. That's not the goal of this. Um, the the other thing I would say is that you may want to think about an R25 mechanism. So we, this is a big, this has been very popular in, in with NINDS has, has this mechanism and it's very popular for our residents because they apply during the residency. It's mentored, they get protected time during the residency and then they get postdoctoral fellowship training time afterwards. So it doesn't require a faculty position. It's very attractive. Every one of our, I swear, every residency applicant that we see in our program is asking about the R25 because it's something that they're interested in. And then finally, I will, uh, just to come, come back to my initial comment, I would love to see this concept replicated in, in adult diseases and not just housed in pediatrics. And so I would hope that we can bring something forward like this that increases the pool of physician scientists in diseases that are beyond pediatrics eventually. All right, I took too much time. <laughs> Thanks, go ahead, Muller. Ooh, somebody's got feedback. Okay, go ahead. I have one question. Um, is there any attention to risk factors such as race, gender, and risk factors not only in terms of exposure to environmental health hazards, but also in um, less attainment mm -hmm. of education? Um, and there is another uh, criteria that I would, I, I would like to suggest. If the um, practitioner comes from the very community or the area in which he or she is going to serve, or oh, linguistic communities as well. I think those are all excellent points, and you know we have not specified exactly what it could be, and I, we would see the great value in the flexibility for the applicant institutions to come in and say, we work with X community. This is a, a focus that we have in terms of engaging lower socioeconomic, urban, rural, whatever it might be. And this would be the type of fellowship that they would, uh, opportunities that they would be able to provide. So um, I think we would leave that up to our applicants, but we can certainly highlight that within the concept itself. So thank you, Arisa. Okay, there were yes, two. Liam, I would like to. Go ahead, Michael, speak louder so we can hear you. Uh, yeah, uh, this is Michael. I'd like to just note that a great deal of the work that the PESU do uh, is in environmental justice communities. So uh, there is definitely uh, that, that focus in, uh, in the work of the PESU. Okay, thank you. Right on this side, we had two. It was. Jose and Maureen. So, so very interesting. My question is, was there ever a consideration given to including pharmacists as potential fellow? We have uh, approximately 1,000 board certified pediatric pharmacists. Mm. And actually, when you look at pharmacy and their education, probably had, they probably have more foundational knowledge in toxicology and, health, and environmental health sciences than some other mm -hmm. uh, healthcare professionals that are there. So I would encourage you into looking into the possibility of, of, of expanding this and including pharmacists. All right, thank you. Thank you. Maureen? 
So first to Michael. Um, hi, Michael. This is Maureen Lichtfeld. I am glad that um, you're keeping the PISU program alive uh, as the mom of the program way back when. Um, and then um, so Definitely recognize that. <laughs> Sorry? He recognizes your role. Oh, he recognizes my role. Thank you. Um, um, and then some reality from the front line um, for both of you. Um, when we were uh, lucky enough to get funds to build environmental uh, medicine and environmental health capacity after the oil spill, and we put in place a regional uh, environmental medicine and environmental health referral network, uh, these were the results, and, and those were not necessarily the results that we expected. The first is that the most popular, there were three components to the program. One was specialist uh, primary care physician consultation. The second one was community education. And the third one was actually the referral system. And so this is what we learned. Um, one, the most popular component was the, physician, the specialist physician consultation, so the educational component of it. Secondly, um, was the not necessarily the community education component, but the community through community health workers connecting the specialist with the primary care physician because that those patients and a number of them were parents with kids had lost trust in the knowledge of the primary care um, provider, and so the, the role of the community in actually. Uh, identifying the gaps, both educational gaps and research gaps, were clear uh, and were more apparent than just having a, a, a parent and a child refer to a specialist. And so, uh, well, although you have the role of communi communities there and translation, mm -hmm. from a research perspective, the upstream inform informing the research by issues, research questions that really come from the front line. And secondly, by informing the education piece, I think is critical. The last thing I would say is that um, it's important, however that clinical training happened, that some of that clinical training happens on the front line. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maureen. OK, Arisima, do you have? I have a question. My experience, I'm sorry. Wait, May, is going to go first. My experience with PESHU is one in Guadalajara, where they did a lot of work in Lake Chapala. Um, or do you have others in, internationally that you could say, you know, these are good examples and we have best practices, considering all the immigrant communities that we're receiving in the United States? Michael, I think that one's for you. Um, yeah, let me give one example of um, uh, a Western state activity. There is a Afghan community that uh, was experiencing high levels of uh, lead exposure uh, among the, the children. And uh, our Western state, uh, PESU, started looking at this and you know discovered that though there was a cultural practice uh, using um, a makeup of sorts uh, for uh, for young girls especially. And what they did is two things. One, they were able to identify a Afghan um, translator that uh, they had uh, got to know in um, Afghanistan. Uh, and he started working with that community and what, what they basically did was they found an alternative uh, that allowed the cultural practices to continue but didn't expose the children to to the lead. So that's one example, but uh, you know we could we could look and identify others as well. And the same uh, your question Did though? that uh, answer your question? Yeah, okay. Okay, so I think we need to wrap up because we need to get the bus. Uh, back to campus and um, we need to close because we need to move on to dinner. So anybody else who wants to add to this, we could do after we vote. Can we vote first? So just so those who need to leave can leave and you can keep talking. Okay, so can we have a motion to approve this concept? Okay, all in favor, raise your hand and then vote electronically. And then on the phone, you can vote electronically now. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Yep, me too. 
All right, Lynn, you maybe catch up with Liam after, or if you want to. It's a very brief comment, which is following on the comment about pharm pharmacists or pharmacologists that in general clinicians other than MDs that I could imagine that many of them could be fellows. There are researcher nurses, there are PAs mm -hmm. who are researchers, and increasingly healthcare is being carried out by those other categories of care providers, and I would just encourage the, the um, pace used to and be more be yeah. inclusive so of all of those professions, and in, including in language, so that the, lang the language would have to be different because you can't say right. fourth po po yeah. fourth postgraduate yeah. year. That's not true right. in all those professions. So you'd have to have language that's a bit more inclusive. Correct. But I think you could do it. Yeah, William did have some of them mentioned in a slide, and we'll consider the others that were mentioned yeah. today. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and Lynn, if you've got thanks that very much, language, Leo, uh, Linda, you can. So um, thank you, Council, all for a wonderful day, and I really want to thank my folks. I think the concepts that were proposed today are not only great, but were done exceedingly well. So thanks to everybody. Uh, for those of you who are joining um, us for dinner, um, I, I think you go back to your hotel first. Uh, please feel free to undress doesn't sound right. Dress down. <laughs> <laughs> be, be casual. It'll be warm. I can guarantee that. So look forward to seeing you then.